Hey guys, before we dive into this one, I'd just like to say that I now have a Patreon. As some of you know, I am making these videos full time, so anything I can get from that would really go a long way and help take some pressure off, meaning I can spend more time on these videos and make them even better. The link is in the description, so support me today if you can. Anyway, on with the show. If you had told me, sitting there, waiting, in that State of Play livestream on the 2nd of February 2022, what we would experience in the few short months after that, I don't think anyone could have predicted. A game so almost universally despised by not only just its players, but pretty much everyone who heard about it, a creator having to issue a public apology to his fans, and a developer and publisher left thoroughly embarrassed by the whole situation. But now, well over a year later, it's business as usual. Almost as if the whole fiasco never even happened. So, I guess that means everything's been taken care of, right? I'm not going to lie to you, when I started work on this video series about six months ago, my outlook on Gran Turismo 7 was not the same as it is today. I held a view similar to many other people, in the sense of accepting the numerous flaws with the game, but also having a mild amount of optimism in seeing the positives. The fact that GT7 in the state that it was, and still is, works as a baseline to build an excellent game from, and with a few simple tweaks it could eventually get there one day through continual updates. But what I've grown to understand is that if you were to take every critique, every complaint, and every issue that I talk about for the rest of this entire video, translate it perfectly to the point where there is no room for interpretation, and put that directly in front of the people who actually have the power to influence the situation, nothing would change. Nothing. That may seem over the top and a completely wild assertion to make, but that's not simply just a representation of my own disillusionment with GT7. I have very genuine reasons to believe this to be true. Gran Turismo is arguably the most influential racing game franchise of all time. Personally, it's the reason why I love cars and driving more than almost anything else. But through making this series, I came to many realizations. Having to dig through countless interviews, archives, reviews, design decisions, and just piecing everything together has really opened my third eye. The more you understand about the situation that produced GT7, the worse it seems to become. It makes me question not only the nature of the game, but the intentions of the creator, and even why I love the previous games in the series. Most people were completely blindsided by GT7. But now, understanding everything, even before launch when we were also anticipated for what the game could bring, the signs were already there. But now I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me explain how deep this rabbit hole goes. So grab a drink, some snacks, and settle in, because it's gonna be a long one. This is GT Critique. This is my own personal descent into madness. This is Gran Turismo 7. So it's safe to say that the public perception of Gran Turismo 7 has changed a fair amount since it released back in March 2022. The game, once touted as the saviour of the racing game genre and a long needed return to form for the franchise, has managed to fall so flat on its face that it's quite incredible to think we were ever hyped for it to begin with. As a long term fan of the franchise, stuck with Gran Turismo 3 and having played the game for basically as long as I can even remember, you can imagine how I feel about this. With that said, there is still a fair amount to appreciate about Gran Turismo 7. The level of tuning and customization of certain the best in the series, the changeable weather and track conditions simulation is incredible in its depth and detail, and the car models and overall visual presentation are simply second to none. And that's not even mentioning the driving itself. If you simply pick a car on a track and just drive, you'll be hard pressed to find a game that can do it better. There is a reason why I've sunk over 400 hours into this thing. But on the other side of that coin, it's obvious to see that only a tiny fraction of those hours have been in the past few months. On paper, GT7 had every reason to be an outstanding single player experience, but it's difficult to come away from it without an overriding sense of disappointment and wasted potential. To the casual observer, the reasons for this may seem obvious. Force-fed microtransactions and an in-game economy that incentivizes the grind to no end. And there's certainly some truth in that. But if you look beyond the internet commentators and outrage merchants and actually play the game, you begin to understand that it's not so simple. So here I am. This will be the first in a line of videos I intend to make that breaks down every area in which GT7 has either completely failed or not lived up to the expectations. Let's start with something obvious, building a car collection. Something that's been an integral part of the series from the very beginning, and even featured a fair amount in the promotional material leading up to the release of the game as well. 
I mean, they couldn't possibly mess this up. Whoa, hold your horses. First, we've got to understand why collecting the cars was such a big part of these games to begin with. I mean, it is a racing game after all, not fucking trading cards. Well, not yet anyway. So, when the first Gran Turismo came out on the original PlayStation back in 1997, it shipped with almost 180 cars, far in excess of any other races on the market at the time. And not only that, but these were fully licensed real-world cars, which could be bought from a dealership, including second-hand models, at a discounted price, then upgraded and fine-tuned perfection. There were tons of different races and events catering to each type of car, meaning having a diverse collection was almost inevitable, and given you would then win even more cars as you progressed, the ways in which you could build up a collection of them was pretty much endless. And this formula has been the same for basically every Gran Turismo game up until this point. Excluding sport, of course, we're not going to talk about that one today. On paper, that description sounds pretty similar to GT7, doesn't it? Well, why don't we take a look? The problems with the game in this respect start from pretty much the second you boot it up. Well, the music rally isn't great either, but that's not what I meant. So, the game starts by giving you the choice between three starter cars, the Honda Fit, the Toyota Aqua, and Bulbasaur. I mean, the Mazda Demio. So the choice of these three cars in particular is very obvious. They're all Japanese compact cars of very similar performance, and whilst I would prefer the old school Gran Turismo experience of giving you a bit of cash and just letting you loose to buy whatever you can afford, I can somewhat understand this decision. For example, back in Gran Turismo 4, it was very common to find a car for cheap in one of the used dealerships that was just far too good as a starter car. Think something like an R32 GTST or early Lancer Evo, and just completely destroy the early events. So this does make sense to some degree. What doesn't make sense though, is that immediately after choosing your starter car, your first objective is to get the other two. This is introduced through the menu books, which are essentially a series of tasks most of which involve collecting three cars that are linked together in some way, the first of which being, of course, the Japanese compact cars. So, after making your choice, the first thing you do is to make that choice completely meaningless. Some of you may remember how in Gran Turismo 6 they removed this element of choice completely, with every player being forced to start with a Honda Fit. To me, the way Gran Turismo 7 handles this is even more insulting. It gives you this illusion of choice, the idea that, oh no, this is the classic Gran Turismo experience of buying a cheap used car to start your collection and your journey within the game, when it's very clearly not the same thing. I mean, to use the analogy of a Pokemon game, which I've not so subtly been referencing, you may have noticed, imagine that after choosing your starter, you then just have to catch the other two anyway. And then even worse is soon after that, you're pretty much not even allowed to use your starters if you want to progress in the story so they disappear into the Pokedex, never to be seen or thought of again. I mean, that would be insane. It would be like, why? What is this? What even is game design? What's the point? And I understand that these are just the starter cars, and in reality, it doesn't matter that much. I mean, no offense to fans of the Toyota Aqua, if any of you are out there. But the truth is that most people are just going to move on with the game and not really going to care. But for me, I always think back to when I started my first playthrough on Gran Turismo 3, almost two decades ago. After weighing up the options, I came to the choice of the first generation Mazda MX-5 in Mariner Blue and never looked back. And ever since then, I've always had that connection with the car, because it was my choice and how I wanted to use the car going forward in the game, such as which events to use it in and which upgrades to buy, was entirely dictated by me. And that was GT3. That game only had like 10 starter cars to choose from, and only a handful of those were even viable. In Gran Turismo 2, for example, you could find that many starter cars available from a single dealership. Anyway, even now in GT7, I keep a bone stock example of it in my garage just for those memories alone. It's just sad that people starting off with this game, whether they be young kids or just players new to the franchise, will never have that same experience. The design of the game itself means it's simply not possible. And to me, the magic of Gran Turismo is those types of experiences, and that's what inspires people to collect so many cars and just enjoy them. Not being lectured by a JPEG of some random guy as to why you should care. I mean, does anyone actually give a shit about the fuel efficiency of a Honda Fit? Is this really the most compelling way you could think of to get people invested in these types of cars? I don't think so. So, if this idea of forced collection, if you will, was just confined to the start of the game, honestly, 
I wouldn't have too much of a problem with it. Being truthful, I didn't really notice it when I first played through the game. It was only when I thought back about it after all was said and done, and then played through the game for a second time that I realised this. The issue is that this is the single player experience of GT7. You are presented with a menu of three cars, you have three races, and you need to finish in the top three to win each car. The races themselves are not that exciting or challenging, for the most part. You then come back to the PNG of a cafe owner, and then you do it all over again. Bar the old break to do something truly thrilling like washing your car. I mean, come on guys, there were only 39 of these in the game at launch. Did you really need to put in filler? And you have to wonder why they even bothered adding back something like the used car dealership, when the progression is so linear and the choice is basically irrelevant. They also changed how the stock of cars updates. No longer does it update based on in-game days, which progress when you do races or other events, thus giving you incentive to continue playing, but instead real-world days. A simple change, but one that makes it far less rewarding to play through the game, and you see far fewer cars, and therefore have far fewer options. Also, everybody who logs in on a given day will always see the same cars for sale as any other player. Why they had to homogenise even this aspect of the used car dealership is beyond me. Even still, imagine saving up for a new car that you really want, finally buying it, and then seeing it in one of the menu books 10 minutes later, thus giving you an event in which you can win it from very easily. You can of course finally sell cars, as of the November update, however, what you may not have noticed is that you can't do that until you finish the final menu book anyway. The game puts so many roadblocks in the way of having a unique experience that the message is painfully clear. Play the game how we want you to, not how you want to. I feel like, and I imagine that a lot of people felt this way, that the menu books were just like an extended tutorial, and at some point the training wheels would come off, and the game would open up much in the same way the older games were from the very beginning. Problem is, when you finally get to that point, the game just f***ing ends. Seriously, you get to race group through cars for the first time, and that's it. Nothing more to see here folks, we're done. Bear in mind, you don't even get to the point of collecting any group through cars in the actual menu books. You earn a couple of Ferraris, and that's as far as you get. You can get a few more cars through the license tests and missions, and to be fair, there are a few race cars and higher value cars among them, but still, this is just a drop in the ocean. I mean, look at it this way. Through the menu books, you collect 63 cars. Not a huge amount to start with, and when you consider that each of these are earned from just a single race, let's just say it's not the most in-depth single player you're going to find. Aside from the Group B collection, which it seems like they only put in the game to make the dirt tracks not entirely redundant in the single player, there are no collections featuring race cars, whether that's Group 4, Group 3, Group 2 or Group 1, just none of them, no higher end supercars or hypercars, not really any classic cars, no Vision GTs and no non-grouped race cars or just any other cars which don't fit into these categories. Now, some of you may look at that and say, oh, it's obvious, they're all high-value vehicles. No way they're just going to give them away so easily. It's supposed to force you towards spending real-world money. Just one problem with that. If that was their goal, why would they shape the entire single-player experience and all of the races and championships they're in almost entirely around the few cars that you do earn in the menu books and then leave the rest of them completely in the dark? You would think that to drive up the desirability of them, they would do almost the exact opposite of that. If that were the case, no. The real issue is that the core single player experience, and of course the events and races within that, only exist to serve that handful of cars from the menu books, as opposed to the previous games which would serve pretty much all of the cars. You know, go back to GT3 or GT4, you pick any car from those games, and you can find an event to use it in 99% of the time. The exception to this being the odd one or two cars like the Nike One or the Benz Patent Motor Wagon, which, fair enough, there's really not a lot you could do with them anyway. I don't think anyone was crying out for a Motor Wagon one make championship after all. But still, the way these types of fringe cars were handled in the previous games was far better than what we have in GT7. The Motor Wagon, for example, is given out as a prize car for completing the European Classic Car League. That makes sense. And that's true of pretty much all of these types of cars in the older games. You would earn them naturally by just winning races and playing through the game. GT7 does not do this. No, GT7 has the Legend Cars dealership. Of all of the multi-million credit cars, bar a couple that you can get from the driving missions and things like that, 
you have to buy them yourself. Playing the game is simply not good enough. And these are cars, mind you, most of which have next to no utility in the game whatsoever. Let's look at an example. The Alfa Romeo 8C 2900B Touring. When I saw this car originally in the trailers for the game, I thought, that's interesting, I wonder what that would be like to drive. Sure, it's not really going to be much use in the main single player, but still, it'd be cool to try it out in a couple of classic car events. It costs 20 million credits, and there is no other way to obtain it. And this is not an outlier. There are many cars like this, and they're all contained neatly in one place, in fact. In the case of the Alpha, I've just accepted the fact I'm probably never going to get it, not unless there's suddenly a way of earning insane amounts of money quickly and consistently, or they start giving out prize cards again, instead of just f***ing roulette tickets. But that's a problem for another day. I simply can't justify spending that much money on a car which is in essence completely useless. And they know this is an issue, because they sold it in the previous games by giving them out as prize cards. They don't have to do that, they could just lower the prices to a level which is more acceptable, and actually fits with the in-game economy, rather than tying it to the real-world value, which for these types of cards have basically zero relevance to the desirability of them in the game. To be honest though, I think they got it right the first time. Earning cars which are relevant to the event or championship you win them from, and then scaling the performance and value of the price cars against the length and difficulty of the event makes so much sense. But clearly, too much sense for Gran Turismo 7. I hope that through the course of this video I've been able to accurately describe why I think Gran Turismo 7 is such a betrayal to the franchise when it comes to this core element, collecting cars. I haven't even mentioned that the way of levelling up in this game is tied directly to the value of the cars that you collect, and that's because it's completely irrelevant. They could have just unlocked all of this stuff from the beginning, and it wouldn't have made much of a difference. If anything, it might have made the game a little bit better. GT7 is not an outlier in this sense, because pretty much every other time the series has tried to implement a level system, it's just come across as completely arbitrary and meaningless. I mean, take Gran Turismo 5. That game locked cars and events behind these level barriers even if you'd earned the license needed for the event, and had enough money to buy the car. It just made no sense at all. GT7 doesn't take it that far, but it is still quite questionable, such as how it locks online play behind your car collection level, meaning you have to slog through a couple of hours of menu books before you can even race online. Why? Who the hell knows? Another point is that I think the power of Gran Turismo as a tool to educate people about cars, automotive history, and just get them really invested in it all often goes overlooked. But I myself am proof of this. Gran Turismo is the main influence that got me to love cars, motorsport, and car culture as a whole, and it did this in such a subtle way. As an example, you could exhaustively explain the nuances between different drivetrain configurations and the mechanical theory behind them, but if someone doesn't have that initial interest to begin with, they're just not going to care. As a child playing these games, I was firmly in this camp, and I'm sure any 4-5 to five year old wouldn't have the interest nor mental capacity to understand anyway. But the way the game presented these ideas was simple. They had events for each type of drivetrain, the FF Challenge, FR Challenge, 4-wheel drive challenge, and MR challenge, and through playing these, the different cars you would drive, and how they handled, you got this basic understanding of what that means, and how each of them is unique. It's the same reason why they would sometimes have two of the same license tests, but one done with a front-wheel drive car, and the other done with a rear-wheel drive car. It's passive teaching, and this was done for many different types of cars based on things like the engine, the body style, the era it was produced in, and the country it came from. Do you see how this is far more appealing than what GT7 does by just forcing these ideas down people's throats, leaving newer players bored and confused, and more experienced players unrewarded and frustrated? It's a simple theory that is used in real-world education, in terms of how teachers get their students to engage with the topic they're learning about. It is debatable whether Polyphony was actually trying to do this in the older games, I think primarily they were just trying to make a game which had variety and was fun to play, but the impact is still clear to see. It's then amazing to think about how GT7 flipped this around, despite the educational aspect of being one of the key targets of the game. One of the most basic events, the MR Challenge, isn't even in the game at the time of writing. That's just absurd. 
Anyway, an important thing to consider about GT7 is that it's a live service, and a game that's always updating and expanding. Surely that's a reason to be optimistic for the future, right? Well, let me put it this way. It's been about 10 months since the game released, and not a single thing I've talked about in this video has been addressed in any meaningful way whatsoever. Take the most recent update. What did we get? A few cars, which was very nice. A few more races, which the game is still sorely lacking in, but these ones are just more of the same shit we already have and don't really expand the game. And extra menus. Oh boy, extra menus. If you thought the act of collecting cars was hollow and pointless in the main game, you haven't seen the extra menus. Check out how the game entices you to drop a few million on some Bugattis, not because you would want to drive them or there's a new event to actually use them in, but because you earn a roulette ticket which offers the chance of getting a fabled engine swap, which in my case was one that I already had. A lot of. So, to summarise, I just spent a large amount of money to buy a couple of cars I didn't really want, for the opportunity to get a prize that I do want, but because of the luck based system of prize giving I ended up with something completely useless to me, and now a few million credits out of pocket. If this isn't a perfect example of every criticism I have of how GT7 fails to promote the idea of car collecting, or even understand why people do it in the first place, then I don't know what is. The AI in Gran Turismo 7 is not very good. I know, quite the hard take and very brave of me to say, but the truth is that anyone who's played this game already knows that when it comes to single player racing, you're in for a bad time. Or at the very least, a disappointing time. But how did we get here? The AI in Gran Turismo has been so consistently bad for such a long time that it's honestly kind of impressive. In the earlier games, they had a tendency to be a bit erratic, but they weren't much different from other games around that time. So, in my view, the issues really started to come into focus on Gran Turismo 4, where their severe lack of awareness started to become a little more noticeable. Through the PlayStation 3 era, they did improve in that respect, but something even more worrying began to take hold. They got really f***ing slow. As in, getting beaten by a tuned Suzuki GSX-R4 in the GT World Championship kind of slow. I know this because I managed to do it myself. When it came to purely their speed, Gran Turismo 6 was for certain the nadir of the series. But here we are with Gran Turismo 7, still dealing with these same old issues. However, what I think most people don't appreciate is just how ridiculous the AI can get when you really dig into it. It's not a case of the AI simply being slow or lacking awareness. This is a story of manipulation so extreme that having a decent race is seemingly not possible, by design. Bizarre decisions and limitations which stifle any hope of enjoying competitive races how you want to, and just incredible inconsistencies that leave you wondering if Polyphony simply now hates single player racing and despise the fact that it even needs to be in GT7. Oh, and on top of all of that, I'm going to try and explain why when you dig beneath all of this, the AI is actually incredibly good and, in some ways, the best in the series. Yeah, this is going to be a weird one. So strap yourselves in as we take a deep dive into the offline racing experience of Gran Turismo 7, where it falls down, where it pulls itself back up, and even a preview into the future of the franchise. Before we begin, I should mention that everything I'm about to state is through the lens of my own speed and ability on GT7. I regard myself as quite a fast driver, I don't have too many issues getting gold times in the time trials, for example, at least when they don't allow tuning, but I don't practice every day and I'm nowhere near my peak as I was back in the early GT Sport days, for example, so of course your own experience with the game may differ slightly. Also, I always have the AI set to its hardest difficulty, so all the footage you see will be based on that. With that said, there are a few things about this game which are so uniformly agreed on as the computer-controlled opponents being absolute trash to race against. Pick almost any race in the main single player, and here is what you'll get. You'll start at the back of a long queue of cars, each of which are a fair distance away from the cars directly in front or behind, meaning you have a massive deficit to the leader, and your goal is to make up that time in the few laps you have available. This setup alone means that actual racing is simply not going to happen. If you have a 30 second gap to the leader and 5 laps to close it down, you don't need a mathematician to tell you that you're going to have to go pretty damn fast, to the point where your so-called opponents are just rolling roadblocks and all that matters is your gap to the leader. I mean, how can you have a race wherein you need to be at least 6 seconds a lap faster than all the other cars? 
is a formula that's destined to produce races which in the best case are tedious and predictable, at the worst downright infuriating to play. This is nothing new to Gran Turismo. Pretty much from the start of the 7th generation of consoles, Polyphony now had the power to put more than 6 cars on the track at a time, and what they did with this newfound power was to have all the cars lined up with a rolling start, then they drive around at a cripplingly slow speed and you overtake them one after the other until the race is over. In a lot of cases they would drive so slow that it would actually become a hazard on the track, breaking in the middle of corners for seemingly no reason and just being a general nuisance. The goal of this setup is to create a form of what I like to call manufactured difficulty. In GT6 in particular, the AI was simply not programmed to be fast enough in most scenarios, so the developers chose to have all the opponents stretched over a distance, meaning that even with their lethargic pace, it still took a few laps to get in front. If they'd stuck with the traditional grid starts, you couldn't have gotten ahead in a matter of seconds. The obvious solution is just to make them fast, but maybe we were asking for too much there. The difference with GT7 is that as you play through a race, you'll notice something interesting start to happen. The opponents get noticeably faster, and it's not quite the same as the traditional rubber banding, which is where the AI will suddenly be able to stick with the player once they get in the lead, thus not allowing them to get too far ahead. The key difference is that this starts to happen long before the player actually gets into the lead, and it's not a case of them going faster than they should be able to, but instead just closer to their true pace. So what I've discovered is that the AI runs on an internal clock, which dictates their speed. Now, this clock is informed by the total lead which the leading AI car has over the player. So the further behind the player is, the slower they will drive. And of course, the closer behind the player is, the faster they will drive. And this begs the question, if you're capable of making them decently fast, why not keep them at the speed to start with and make the grids much closer so we can have a much more competitive race? What's worse is that this internal clock is seemingly programmed the same for every AI, meaning that you can have races where you as the player are miles behind the leading AI car, but there are many other AI drivers just crawling along as well because their internal clock is telling them that they need to drive slow to allow you to catch up, even if you might already be ahead of them. It's just baffling to think about. And something which emphasises this even more is how so many races in the single player have a ridiculous spread of car performance. Why have a race with an F8 Tributo alongside a Dino and then basically everything in between? It ends up lapped in what is not a very long race, because obviously it does, and again begs the question of why? Why have such a spread which ends up with one or two cars that you're actually competing with and the rest just being placeholders? All of this adds up to an experience which doesn't exactly tally with the reality of actual competitive motorsport, whether this be in real life or even just virtual. The disconnect between how GT7 views racing in sport mode, from just daily races all the way up to the World GT series, is in complete contradiction with the racing presented in the single player. And to be honest, I'm not really sure what they were trying to achieve by doing all of this. So, you could say that this is to try and accommodate newer players who may struggle with more intense races, but if that was what they were trying to do, then they completely failed at that as well. Some of these races are really difficult, even for me. In some cases you just simply don't have enough laps to pass everyone, and sometimes the AI's true pace is actually really good, which we'll talk more about later. The positive is that you don't need to win to progress in the game, but this is a racing game. If you're not trying to win, then what's the point? And this can then lead to player retaliation, at least it does for me. Yeah, you can criticise me all you want for my driving here, but my point is clear. Over the course of the race, I've been by far the fastest driver, I'm not going to lose because the game handicapped me by starting so far from the lead and then only giving me two laps to overtake everyone. If the game is not going to respect me as a player, I sure as hell am not respecting it. And that takes us neatly back to the contradiction with sport mode, and of course the idea of sportsmanship. The first rule of having a good race is mutual respect, so in this case treating the AI as if they were human players. It doesn't help that sometimes the AI follow their fixed path so rigidly that they end up doing this. Suzuka I find is particularly bad for them, they seem to just turn into the corners with no regard for where the player actually is. With all of this put together, the end result is that as a player you just can't respect the AI, even if, like me, you're really into the idea of competitive offline racing. You can either be numbed by the tedium of these races, or to entertain yourself, you might end up doing things that make you look bad. But hey, forget about all of that, because Gran Turismo 7 has a solution. 
Ladies and gentlemen, custom race. Okay, that's good, you can you can stop now. So, if you're like me, one thing that would have really annoyed you is how the intro to the game shows these interesting races which don't actually exist in the game, at least at the moment. They use cars which never see the light of day in the actual single player events, and also in how they portray the races, with cars actually being tightly packed together, racing amongst one another. Look at this, a full grid of cars at Trial Mountain. That doesn't happen in the main event, but with Custom Race, we have the option to recreate this ourselves. Why don't we give it a go? Ah, I see the issue. This leads us to our next problem. The opponents are wildly inconsistent. Depending on the track and even the car they're driving, their pure speed can differ massively. They tend to struggle the most with high commitment corners, so the first few turns at Trial Mountain, Death Chicane at Dragon Trail Seaside, places like that they are just abysmal, regardless of whether their speed is being manipulated or not. Oh, and at the Nordschleifer, for some reason they just pull off to the side of the track and indicate you passed. They did this back in GT Sport as well, and I still have no clue as to why. I guess that's great if you want to make your own Touristan Farten session, but then just make it an option. This is custom race, we're supposed to be racing here. Why did they go to the effort of even programming this? Are they really that committed to never giving you good races with the AI? Anyway, moving on to high speed ring. You'll notice that a lot of the time they don't use the banking in the corners, and as such they're way slower than they could be, but also sometimes they do. What's going on here? Originally, it seemed to me as though they wouldn't use the banking in road cars, but they would with the racing cars, but it's not actually that simple. See, the Alpine A220 is a racing car, but comes with comfort soft tyres. Even if other racing cars from that era come with racing cards, yeah, I don't know either. The point is that AI drivers in the Alpine won't use the banking, and even if you equip them with racing cards, they still don't. Was this supposed to be intentional or just an oversight? The fact that you can't really tell anymore speaks volumes about this game. I love to show the inverse of this, running an AI with a car that normally has racing tyres, but using sports or even comfort tyres. However, that leads us to our next point. So, to demonstrate all of this, I've been using a brand new feature of the custom race in GT7, the ability to use the cars that you have in your garage as your AI opponents. So, not gonna lie here, I was pretty hyped when I found out that this was in the game. Just think of all the possibilities for the different races you could make, whether that be imitating real world championships, events from past GT games, or just your own original creation. I'm very glad they decided to add this feature, but let's just say that it has some quirks. Firstly, if you give an AI a car from your garage, they drive it in exactly the same state in which you left it. Same upgrades, same visual customization, and identical tuning. And that's great, except for what happens with the tyres. You see, if you leave the car with the stock tyres that it came with, happy days, no issues, the AI just uses those tyres. If you change the tyres though, say from comfort soft to sports hard, they still use the stock tyres. They drive the car exactly how you make it, apart from the tyres where they just don't give a f at all. And then even weirder is that for racing hard tyres and racing hard tyres only, they will use those if you equip them but any other grade of tyres and they switch back to the stock set. And even if you choose racing mediums or softs, they'll default to racing hards as well. <sighs> it's never simple with these guys. With the return of changeable weather to the series, we also have the option to set up our own weather scenarios, which again, is awesome, but again, comes with its own set of caveats. If you set up a custom race that starts off dry, becomes wet, and then goes back to dry, you'll find something interesting. For Group 3 cars, for example, the AI always use racing cards in the dry, except when changing from wet tyres back to dry tyres, because now they all use racing softs. You may be noticing a theme. Polyphony really seem to struggle to program their AI to use tyres in a way which is consistent and actually makes some sort of sense. A very simple fix for all of this would be to just give us the option to set our own tyre restrictions, like the career mode races have, so we can decide which compounds can be used by both the player and the AI. But that's not all. The rolling start interval option is broken. If you try to change it, 
it defaults to the smallest distance and you can't fix it. This has been an issue since the game launched and they've still yet to patch it or even recognise it as an issue. Just inexcusable. If you don't want to set up your own custom grid, which is understandable since it is fairly time consuming, you can let the game choose for you. The options are for a random grid, a one make race or a specific group of racing cars. This is nothing out of the ordinary, other than random doesn't mean entirely random since the opponent selected will always be of somewhat similar performance to the car that you drive, but even this has its problems. If you get in a grouped racing car, say a group 4 car, if you choose random opponents you just end up with other group 4 cars, and sometimes even just the same car, which makes this entirely redundant since we already have those as other options. So this boils down to how the cars are classed. There are basically three, sometimes four classes, which behind the scenes, every car in the game gets filtered into. Firstly, road cars and professionally tuned cars, then grouped racing cars, so groups one, two, three, four, and other cars. So by other cars, we just mean things like non-grouped racing cars, as in classic racers, single seaters, etc., uh, Vision GTs, and anything else which is neither a conventional racing car or a road car. So if you play GT Sport, you might know where I'm going with this, because this is just Group X. For those who don't know, Group X was a way for the developers to put all of the other cars which didn't fit into the normal groups into their own group. The reality is that Group X was not actually a group, because it was specifically for cars which didn't have a group. And if it didn't have a group, due to the way GT Sport was designed, it meant that the car was effectively useless. Unless you wanted to have a one-make race, there was nothing to do with them. With the launch of GT7, I and a lot of other people were under the impression that this would be solved, since all the cars would once again be rated under the performance point system, meaning if it didn't have a group, you could still class it around its performance level. And in the main single player, it is sort of fixed, since you can use many of these Group X cars in different events. The difficulty is that there just aren't enough events for these types of cars, but that's not an issue specific to Group X. And don't think I've forgotten about this travesty, I'm going to go in depth on this another time, just you wait. How this relates to custom race is that since the random option only gives opponents within the specific type of car you're driving, a road car always ends up with road cars as opponents, grouped racing cars always end up with cars in the same group, and with a Group X car, you always end up racing against these oddballs, the cars that don't fit anywhere else and have nothing in common. I suppose this is better than only having a one make race as the option, but still, they could have very easily made this so much better. Here's my proposal. There should be an extra option wherein the game still randomly selects the opponent cars but within parameters which you as the player can decide. For example, there could be a slider option that allows you to set a PP range limit, so say you want to race against specifically 550 PP opponents, you can set this limit in the range of 540 to 550 and then the game can also fill the grid based on any car in this performance point range. Then taking this further, we could also have options that we can tick, such as do you want road cars to appear as opponents? What about racing cars or these other Group X cars? And from there, you can mix and match the type of opponents that you want to show up. Maybe they could even use tags for this, and we could filter opponents based on things like do we want specifically K cars or EVs to appear, and again you can mix and match all of that. Sure, we can do all of this manually with the custom grid, but again, it is time consuming to find all the specific cars you want from your garage, and also you need to own all the cars, which, as we discussed in the last video, may not be realistic for most people. I've always felt that this would be a great addition, but maybe that's just me. Let me know in the comments. Now, I know this doesn't quite fit with the topic, but since we're talking about custom race, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the payouts. What payouts? It's probably what you're thinking. Yeah, it's well known that the prize money for custom races are appallingly low. While I agree that the payouts shouldn't be quite as high as the main single player races, otherwise there would be literally no incentive to actually do them, it is still quite shocking. Using this race at Sardinia as an example, which is one of the best money makers, Remaking it in custom race gives you a max payout of less than 9% of the original race. Even if you can beat these Group 3 cars with a Fiat 500, it doesn't get much better. If we push this to its extreme, if you can somehow win a 200 lap race at the Nürburgring 24 hours against Group 1 opponents in the 500, your maximum payout is just over half a mil. Nice, you could buy a few sets of tyres with that. I better call up the boys and we can start making some easy money guide videos. But by far the worst thing about Custom Race is our old friend, the AI manipulation. You know, back in the November update, version 1.26, for some reason they seemingly removed the lap time tower from replays. 
Since then, they haven't noted it as a known issue, and a few months later it's still absent. Is this an oversight like we've seen before, or possibly something more sinister? You see, because of this change, making this video has been quite a bit harder, as it isn't as easy to demonstrate how their lap times change. Was that their intention? Hard to say. But what I do know is that unfortunately for them, I recorded some excellent footage back in October before the update, which really puts things into perspective. So this race starts off like most others, I can overtake the first few cars with relative ease, ending the first lap in 10th, and then they gradually get a little bit harder to overtake as we go on, but still not really much of a challenge. We take the lead on lap 4, and for a few laps nothing really happens, until lap 7 where the magic begins. Some of them start to lap faster than me. As you can see, my lap times have been fairly consistent, and despite not using the catch-up system, known as boost, the AI seemed to be acting as if it were switched on anyway, gradually getting faster as I got further and further ahead of them. So, realising that I'm completely washed, I pull over and let them pass, since they've clearly asserted their dominance, there's no point in fighting. You can probably guess what happened next. They became slower again, right? How much slower? 20 seconds a lap slower. Over what is normally a 90 second lap. To put this in perspective, I did my final lap using only 7th gear, and still ended up going much faster than them. I then got in a stock Mazda RX-8, a car which is just a mere 200 performance points less than the F8 Tributo, and still lapped noticeably quicker. I can understand a little bit of manipulation when it comes to AI lap times, but this has no place in a racing game. Not even the most arcadey, casual oriented game should be subject to this. And it's not as if I've messed around with the settings to make this happen. Like I said, there's no boost, no tire wear or fuel usage, or anything really that could influence it to make this happen. You would think that Gran Turismo, through its 25 years of history, would really want to build on the realism in this area. They do already with the visuals and handling model, so why can't the real driving simulator seem to have realistic racing? It easily could, they just don't want to. Instead, they want players to have this experience where nothing you do matters, where everything is controlled by strings, and they just pull them in the direction that they want to to make it seem interesting and exciting. It would take them less effort to not do this, and just make things more realistic and consistent, but they don't. Anyway, you can see how I like to push things to their extremes when it comes to this game, so how about we demonstrate all of this in a racing scenario? I know, I could show you a race against Group 3 cars where I beat them in a Group 4 car. Yeah, let's do that. No. Actually, I've got a better idea. Yeah, that really just happened. So that was the easy part, because now after systematically going through every single flaw of the AI and the single player racing as a whole, I'm now going to try and convince you why Gran Turismo 7 can provide some of the best offline racing in the entire series. Let me explain. So, I'd really like to frame this by going back to my first day on the game, March 3rd, 2022. Yeah, I pre-ordered got it a day early. So, I think a major thing for me was that I was given so much hope for the single player racing on this game by what I experienced on my first day. 
I had won a Mitsubishi GTO from the license test and had it tuned to about 530pp and that's when I came across this event, the Clubman Cup Plus at High Speed Ring. I was a little bit below the PP limit but still thought I could win given what I'd experienced with the previous games. But when I went into the race, what I found was not what I was expecting. Firstly, it was a grid start where you don't even start right at the back and the AI were actually quite fast and raced hard. I ended up finishing fifth or something and was completely outclassed. Sure, I was new to the game and still getting used to the handling, but I still came away from that race with the feeling of, they've done it, this is real racing, this is what I wanted. In total, there are four Clubman Cup Plus races, and each of them are somewhat like this. We're gonna focus on three of them, the one at High Speed Ring, the one at Tokyo Expressway, and the one at Sakuba. The one I'm missing off is at Goodwood, which is a one-make race for the Mini Cooper. It is still decent, but I've spent a lot more time doing the other three because I think they're more interesting, so we're going to leave this out for the moment, even if you do get to race against the legend himself. Hello viewers, Super GT here. It was pretty much at about this point here that he knew that he was going into the Shadow Realm. For me, the standout of these three is the Sakuba race. Despite starting in 5th with the leader right in front of you, it manages to be an incredibly challenging race. It definitely helps that Sakuba is one of the best tracks for the AI, they're always pretty good here and race decently well. I'd estimate I've done this race maybe 40 times total and probably only won it about 25% of the time. The other two races aren't quite as hard when you get used to them, but if you detune your car you can still have a good time. Another great thing about these races is that the game chooses your opponents from a pool of about 30 different cars starting in a random grid order, meaning that every time you do a race you're going to have a different experience, unlike a lot of other races in this game which always have the same opponents starting in the same order, and as such there's tons of replay value, hence why I've done them so many times. The funny thing is, doing research for this video I found that searching for Clubman Cup Plus you'll end up finding people just complaining about how difficult it is. Given my issues with many of the other races in this game, I find that somewhat ironic. You can't please everyone, I guess, but they do have a bit of a point. I think the fact that so many races in the single player are just you passing AI cars as if they're not even there, and then you come to something like this where they actually race you and have decent pace, you get a kind of whiplash effect from just how different that is. It doesn't help that, like many of these comments point out, some of the cars you race against seem to be over the performance point limit. It's particularly evident with the engine swapped cars, so this RX-7 with the R26B and the 911 powered Beetle, they are just absurdly fast on the straights and you don't really have much of a chance. Or at least, they were. Because after the October version 1.25 update, they became clearly slower. At Sakuba, they went from doing high 1 minute 2s to high 1 minute 3s as the ultimate pace. And this was the update, bear in mind, that changed the physics engine to make cars generally faster across the board. The crazy part is that, even still, Sakuba race is for me by far the best race in the game. Now, you do have to detune your car a bit given the AI nerf, but you can still have a lot of fun with it. The question is then, why did they only give us a handful of races like this and then make the rest of them as a sort of cat and mouse chase? Again, they can very easily do it, they just don't want to. And since these races are just on the side and not connected with the menu books in any way, it's entirely possible that there are people out there who've played the entire game and not even known that these races exist. And the worst part is that because you unlock these races so early on in the game, obviously you expect there to be more of them, because why would there be? They're excellent. And that's why I had so much hope after the first day, because to me, it seemed like they finally understood what we wanted with these races, but it ended up just being a carrot dangled in front of us. It's a tease of what this game could have been if they actually tried. So, for all my complaints with how Custom Race was handled, there is some redemption to be had. So, do you remember the boost function from earlier? It turns out that if you switch this on, it actually has the potential to make things a lot better. If you put boost on weak, it actually reduces the degree to which the AI are manipulated and as such diminishes this yo-yo effect that it causes. It's not perfect, but like I said, depending on the car and track combination, it can sometimes work very well. What I tend to find though is that if you're in a scenario where the AI are a little bit faster than you, they'll pull away for the first couple of laps, then gradually their pace drops off until you pass them, at which point they stick to your rear bumper in classic rubber band fashion. If you make a mistake, they will overtake again, but if you drive clean, they just sit behind and nothing really happens. The good thing is though that they only slow down to a point, you're not going to find them lapping 20 seconds off the pace for example, so if you choose a slightly slower car and maybe a lower grade of tyres, you can actually have a pretty decent race. 
I have to give a shout out here to the custom race thread on GT Planet for a lot of this information. It really helped to piece it all together. These poor bastards are dedicated to making custom race work, despite Polyphony's best efforts to make it as frustrating as possible. Check them out if you want ideas for your own custom races, as there's tons to see, such as race replays, car setups, and even custom championship tables. They even go to the length of buying several of the same car just so the opponents can drive them with different liveries. You've got to respect the grind. Also, putting on tyre wear seems to help with some of the tyre anomalies I mentioned earlier, so give that a go. All this is to say that I actually think the AI in GT7 is inherently good, with a few exceptions, but just completely throttled by all the bullshit that's put on them, whether that be the manipulation of their actual speed, or the bizarre inconsistencies which they are subject to. In isolation, I've seen the AI race amazingly well, make daring overtakes, use interesting lines, and at times even have incredible raw pace. It's just so rare that you find yourself in a situation where you actually get to see any of this, and that's the real tragedy. So, why do all of this? That's the million dollar question, I suppose. I'm not 100% sure on that. In GT5, 6, and even Sport to a degree, it seemed like a way of masking the fact that the AI were just quite slow. Like we said, it's the idea of manufactured difficulty, challenge not because the AI have decent pace, but because the scenario that you the player are put in leaves you at a massive disadvantage which you need to overcome. But as we've seen, the opponents in GT7 can give good races when they're allowed to, so what was the goal? To simply piss off the fanbase even further? It's clear that many people have had enough of this. Even looking at the comments from my previous video, which had nothing to do with the actual races, there were quite a few people lamenting the fact that this was still happening despite the complaints for well over a decade at this point. But instead of responding to that, they seem to have doubled down, and now it's probably the worst it's ever been in the series. So, now that we've discussed all the ways the AI has been made deliberately worse than it actually is, we need to talk about the AI that is quite literally superhuman. That's right, GT Sophie. So to put it briefly, GT Sophie is a form of AI which uses machine learning to essentially learn car and track combinations from scratch, much in the same way a real person does rather than relying on pre-programmed instructions to drive the car. This allows it to effectively have unlimited potential when it comes to raw speed, and also the manner in which it races with other cars. To a lot of people, this will be the silver bullet. It doesn't matter that the AI we have now is bad, because we've got GT Sophie on the way. Man, I hate to be so negative about this stuff, but it doesn't seem that obvious to me. Think about it this way. How will Sophie be implemented in the game as it is now? I mean, they're not going to rip up all the AI from the single player events we have now and just replace them with Sophie. No way that's going to happen. From how it's been described as a teacher, a student, and a friend to race with, it seems as though the idea for Sophie is more intimate, as in everyone can have their own version of the Sophie AI which they can race with, rather than Sophie being a wholesale replacement for the AI we have at present. And when you think about it like that, it does make sense. Why would GT7 implement all of the downgrades to the current AI on purpose, just to replace it with a superhuman AI that's as fast as it needs to be, but can also race incredibly well? Why the sudden U-turn? More than anything, it seems like a training tool. I can definitely see Sophie implemented into sport mode in some way. Maybe instead of watching videos about sportsmanship and racing etiquette, you would have to race with Sophie, and those ideas could be demonstrated that way. The idea of using Sophie for B-spec has also been floated around as well, but if that's just going to be racing against the regular AI we have now, then I don't really see much points. If it could be a case where we can race our version of Sophie against other people's, sort of like the remote races from GT5, then that could be interesting. The key issue though is the limitation of current technology. Creating Sophie is quite an intensive process, and certainly not one a PS5 alone can handle. So, would it just be a case of the developers uploading a version of Sophie into GT7 once it's learnt certain car and track combinations? If so, that would really limit its usability when it comes to the whole student, teacher and friend dynamic. Still, GT Sophie is for certain the thing I'm looking forward to the most that's coming to GT7 at some point, not that it's much of a competition, but regardless, we are still stuck with the AI and the racing we have at the moment, in all of its bizarre, self-defeating glory, and we just have to make the most of it. So, we've talked about car collecting, we've talked about the AI races, but just why does Gran Turismo 7 feel so unrewarding to play through? Well, other than the aforementioned reasons. I think a lot of it comes down to the structure of the game, how it's been designed. But how could a game that throws cars at you near constantly, and where earning money honestly isn't that difficult, manage to feel like a grind? 
To me, like most things, it's all about balance. And this is where game design is so important. But with GT7, it feels like Polyphony just took all of their collective knowledge accumulated over the past quarter of a century on game design and just threw it in the toilet. And then launched that toilet into the fucking sun. It's no joke to say that when it comes to some of the design decisions made in GT7, it's baffling to think that a team which has showed their incredible talent on so many occasions could possibly come up with any of this. From decisions which give the players the option to not even engage with the gameplay itself, to reward systems which actively make players feel like they're being insulted and made fun of, GT7 truly has everything. Even where the game succeeds, it still manages to make illogical choices with how certain things are handled. It's almost as if nobody considered how any of these choices would impact the player experience, or even what people come to a Gran Turismo game for. We're also going to talk about how GT7 tries to mirror reality in some areas, but in others completely contradicts itself in incredible ways. In this respect, GT7 is a game which achieves in removing, or at least reducing, a lot of the things that made the older games so much fun to play through and almost every new addition being something which could have been done so much better, or in some cases being put in to deliberately make the game less enjoyable, all with the hope of stretching out the experience so players stick around for longer. I wonder how that's working out. But of course, that may not be the only reason for doing all of this. That's right, we're finally going to talk about that elephant in the room. All in good time, but for now, just remember that with Gran Turismo 7, nothing is quite as simple as it seems. It's always difficult to talk about the shortcomings of GT7 without mentioning the successes of the previous games. For me, Gran Turismo 3 is the gold standard when it comes to intelligent racing game design. Whilst not being a completely radical shake-up to the formula from the first two games, there were plenty of subtle tweaks that made it so compelling to play through. The races in GT3 are sorted into five leagues. Beginner, Amateur, Professional, Endurance and Rally. One thing I'd love to highlight specifically is how many events often appear in multiple leagues. So the drivetrain events, FF Challenge, FR Challenge, etc. feature in each of the beginner, amateur and professional leagues. And as you'd expect, going up the leagues they get gradually tougher, with more challenging opponents driving faster cars. And not only that, but the races of course get longer and introduce elements like tyre wear, meaning pit stops may be needed in some of the later races. I love this because as you play through the events, you have so many options with how you go up the ladder. Do you stick with the car you used in the beginner league and just upgrade it to keep up with the competition? or maybe save up for a higher performance car which you really want, or even use a car which you'd want as a prize car that's eligible for the event. Combine this with the sheer amount of variety of these events, and it means that basically any car you have in any state of tune will be competitive in at least one event, but usually more. The only difficulty with GT3 is that since the opponent car performance isn't listed anywhere, it can be a bit of trial and error to find an event that your specific car fits into. Either way, I think elements like this are where game design really shines in racing games. More often than not though, I feel like this sort of thing is completely disregarded, with the mainstream only concerned with how the game looks and how it feels to drive. Check out this review of GT7 from IGN. Hardly anywhere does it even mention the single player structure, and when it does, right near the start where it outlines what the menu books are, the author doesn't seem to think it's much of a difference from previous GT games, stating, The racing events the Gran Turismo Cafe deliberately threads us through all make up part of the large list of career races we'd be otherwise doing anyhow. I guess he's the type of guy who doesn't want to think for himself because Daddy Luca will take care of it for him. This statement alone is odd in quite a few ways, but we'll get onto that soon. By the way, I'd recommend checking out my video on car collecting on GT7 if you haven't seen it already, because it will provide a lot of context to this video. Oh well, this is IGN, what can you expect? That said, he does at least highlight the ridiculous rolling starts which we talked about last time. Man, you've got to know that you f***ed up if even IGN is roasting you about it. A great example I find of game design not really being valued when it comes to racing games is with Dirt Rally 2.0. Let me just say that I adore Dirt Rally 2.0. I've put hundreds of hours into it, and when it comes to an authentic rally experience, there isn't much that even comes close, at least on console. The tarmac physics can be a little wonky sometimes, but it's still fun. Although, as a game, I feel like it could have been easily made better. The single player is extremely bare bones, with a single championship available for both rally and rally cross, and there's no restriction as to which car you can use. If you win, you get promoted up a league, which just means the championship gets longer, 
and if you win the final championship, you just stay in the same league and nothing happens. You might say that it's a rally sim, so the single player doesn't matter. Thing is though, the previous game in the series, Dirt 4, had a fully fleshed out career with various championships for different cars and rallies, as well as a team management aspect where you could hire employees, deal with sponsors, and even design your own livery. The most frustrating part is that Dirt Rally 2.0 keeps some of the team management stuff in the most basic way, to the point where you've got to wonder why they even bothered to be honest. Even if they didn't want to design a full single player again, they could have just copied over the stuff from Dirt 4, and that would have helped massively. It seems though because they market the game as a sim, they just get away with not bothering at all in this area. Forza Horizon 5 is another that doesn't seem much worth in having a structured single player. Pretty much every event that you do as part of the main story allows you to use any car you want and the AI opponents just match what you use. It makes everything feel kind of aimless. Structure matters. Of course, you don't want a game like this to be completely linear, but a little bit of restriction goes a long way in terms of players feeling like their choices actually matter. So let's see what GT7 does in this regard, viewing it from the start of the game. No, not the music rally. I've done this joke before, haven't I? So we've talked about the menu books and how all of that works, but I need to apologize to anyone who watched the car collecting video. You see, I've lied to you all. With the menu books, you do actually have a meaningful choice. The choices are A, do the designated races and win the cars through them, or B, just buy the cars because they always put the ones you need in the used car dealers. Wow, game design. That's right, in this racing game, they give the option to progress without doing any of the races. In theory, if you get lucky with a couple of cars in the Legends dealer, you could complete this game by doing only the championships and no other races in the single player. The only issue would be money. Good thing that after only a few races, you'd be drowning in it. At the point in the game where the menu books would insist on you driving front-wheel drive hatchbacks, you can have enough money to almost buy a supercar. Needless to say, the balance is a little bit off. GT3 had a reputation for being tough for beginners, as breaking out of the early game was quite a challenge. If you were smart about it though, you could do it without being that fast. It was all about investment. So saying, okay, I can do this event with this car, now I have this prize car, can I use it in any other event? Or I could sell it and upgrade my other car with the money and use it for this. And that was all part of the fun. Not that any of this matters now anyway. You see, from update 1.11 back in April last year, a slew of supposed fixes were implemented to the in-game economy. There's a lot to dissect here, and we will, but the one that has the most game-breaking implications is the massive boost to circuit experience payouts. If you're good enough, you can earn millions of credits from just a few minutes of driving. The thing is, you can do these at any point in the game, the only restriction being how quickly you can unlock the tracks by doing the menu books. This means it is possible to earn multiple millions of credits within the first few minutes of starting a brand new game. Of course, not everyone may be able to do this, but even if you can achieve bronze, the payout is insane compared to what you'd normally be earning at this point in the game. When I say that these fixes are just a band-aid over a massive gaping wound, this is what I mean. In fact, this is more like going to the doctors for treatments, they stitch up your wound, and then they pull out a knife and stab you somewhere else. They really didn't consider the implications to progression when they rushed out this fix. Another element we have in GT7 is the good old license tests, back once again. I've got to say, I think they did a pretty good job of them in here. In terms of the tests themselves, the variety and amount of tests feels good, and it's fun to progress and do more of them. For more experienced players, they're not too hard to gold, with the exception of the final test, S10, which is an absolute standout. I wish they applied this much creativity to the rest of the game. And in terms of prizes for completing them, you can earn an interesting and varied selection of cars as well. But like everything in this game, there's a catch. This being that they're pretty much pointless. Only the National B and National A licenses are required in the game, so the IB, IA and S licenses do nothing. Meaning that, as they don't actually grant you access to anything, they are by definition not licenses. How do you f*** that up? Incredible. Anyway, we've talked before at length about how the menu books force you down this narrow path when it comes to car collecting. Making sure you have basically every car you need to progress at almost all times, and dissuading you from buying the cars you want to and making your own decisions, whilst also making the cars you do collect almost instantly redundant. And it seems to me, because this is a racing game, that this sort of terrible design gets a free pass in some people's minds. But could you imagine if other games tried to do this? 
Take a role-playing game, for example. So, say maybe you get a quest from a wise sage to collect some rare artifact. Go to X place and collect this artifact, then bring it back to me. So you go to the place, you defeat some enemies in the area, collect the artifact and bring it back. And say this artifact is a weapon or some armor or something you can use in the game. So you bring it back to the sage, they then proceed to lecture you about why this artifact is so important and unique, and why you should value it so much, and after that they return the artifact to you. He then gives you your next quest, which is to do the exact same thing, but for another artifact. Really? Again? Well, at least I can use my new armor or weapon on this quest. Right? And the whole game is just that repeated like 20 times. If that actually was a real game, it would be mocked incessantly. In fact, if someone even tried to pitch that as a game idea, they would be laughed out of the room. But because Gran Turismo is a racing game, in the minds of some people, including professional game reviewers, it's fine. Because as we know, only the gameplay and visuals seem to matter. Cargo's room, that's all you need. I think another way in which this manifests itself is within the races that are tied to the menu books. Like I said, given GT7's genius design, you can ignore these races almost entirely, but if you decide to do them, you will start to notice something. Aside from the AI and how the race itself is structured, which I talked about in the last video, check it out if you want a full breakdown of that nightmare, the selection of event types is what I mean here. Some people got the wrong impression in my first video where I talked about the impact of the drivetrain events, so FF Challenge, FR Challenge, etc., implying that they didn't exist in GT7. Clearly, if you played the game, you know that they do. The difference is in what form they exist. For example, take the FF Challenge in GT3. There are three of them in three different leagues, getting harder and with faster opponents each time. The car choice is open, so you can use any FF car. In GT7, the only FF Challenge events are the 450pp Japanese FF Challenge. Why so specific? That's because, as I mentioned before, the events in the game serve only the cars from the menu books. In this case, the Japanese FF Sports Cars menu. If this menu didn't exist, then this event would have no reason to exist either, and most likely wouldn't be in the game. And this is why so many of the events from past GT games were, and are, still missing. Another excellent example of this is the Camaro menu. They needed to create an event for this menu, so what do they do? They could have used a past GT event, like Stars and Stripes, or even just make it a Chevrolet one make race. No. Instead, what they made was the American Sunday Cup 600pp. Sunday Cup 600pp. Sunday Cup 600pp. The Sunday Cup is the first event in the game strictly for beginners. Why is there a 600 performance point version of it halfway through the game? That doesn't make any sense. It's just not the Sunday Cup anymore. The name is meaningless. Oh yeah, let me just get in my SRT Viper and do the Sunday Cup. And this happens a lot when you consider all of the events. For the four-wheel drive challenge, the only form of that is the Japanese four-wheel drive challenge 600pp events, because that only exists for the Japanese rally base cars menu. That also explains why there's no MR challenge, because they never created a menu that would need it to exist. This is why there is such a lack of events and event variety in this game, despite what certain game journalists may tell you. This isn't true now, and was even less true back in March 2022. And not only is there a lack of events catering for different cars, but also for the different tracks. I never thought I'd see the day where I unlock a track in Gran Turismo and there are no races for it. How does this even happen? It says a lot that even now, many tracks in the game have barely any races. Take St. Croix as an example. This is an original circuit that has six different variations. When the game launched, there were only two races. And both of them were the exact same variation! Why? Do they do this on purpose? What is wrong with them? Since then, they've blessed us with a third race, and at a different variation this time, imagine that. But even still, the variance is severely lacking. So, beyond regular events, we also have championships returning after their hiatus in GT Sport. We have 10 championships at present, not a huge amount, but as long as each of them are great and a real challenge to beat, then that doesn't really matter. Four of them only have two races. Two races. In past games, almost all events had at least three races, and they're trying to pass off two races as a championship? And both races are at the same track! They're not particularly creative either, because the final few are just generic events for 600, 700, and 800 PP cars respectively. And they added plenty of standalone races for those events as well, so they're not even unique to the championship. 
Oh, and they removed the ability to choose an individual race from a championship to do without having to race through the whole championship. Don't you just love it when developers remove features that were in older games for absolutely no reason? Now, it's not as if the races even get significantly different as you progress in the game. For example, the final championship is about five races, which each take around 10 to 15 minutes to complete, so it's not that long. But the main problem is the format. Like basically every other career race, it's one of those where you start at the back of the grid, miles behind and you just have to catch up to the other cars. I always find it so ironic how in the previous games, where you had only five opponents, and they all started right next to you, you had the option to qualify. But now with 20 cars on the track, where qualifying would actually make a difference and be a nice parallel with, say, sport mode, they don't. One of the talking heads even mentions a qualifying session in one of the races. I guess we just weren't invited then. Further devolving the experience is that these races don't even have tyre wear and fuel usage, so they try to hype it up as the final championship, the pinnacle of racing in GT7, but the experience is pretty much the same as the Sunday Cup, but just with faster cars and slightly longer races. Maybe they should call this the 800pp Sunday Cup. Changeable weather is something that can impact these races, but through the career as a whole, it's very rarely even a possibility. There is a difference between simplifying a game to make it more accessible, and just not using any of the key features. GT7 does the latter, and as such the sense of progression is severely skewed, since by the end of the game, nothing has really changed, even if the game wants to convince you that it has and that you've achieved so much. One benefit of all of this is that playing through the game again to get the footage, it was far less time consuming considering I didn't even have to do half of the races. In the final cutscene at the cafe, after winning the last championship, Sarah mentions that it feels like we only just met yesterday, but the reality is that it's not even been 9 hours since I started. That sums it up better than I ever could. But the saddest part about all of this is of course those we've lost along the way. Those which have provided us with countless hours of joy over the years, and memories we will never forget. Maybe we will see some of them again, but there's a good chance that we never will. So, please, take a moment with me now to reflect on and remember the Gran Turismo events we so dearly miss.
So, that's the main single player in a nutshell, but beyond that, what else is in this game? You might have noticed that I haven't even mentioned the mission events, so let's talk about those. It's no exaggeration to say that for me, the mission events are by far the best part of this game. You get a variety of events, ranging from callbacks to Gran Turismo 4, like the overtake and slipstream challenges, as well as the fabled one lap magic, where you race against much slower opponents who are given a head start, and you have a short amount of time to catch them. Why does that sound so familiar? We also get new challenges like drift events and drag races, which are a lot of fun, as well as these mileage trials, where you're tasked with going as far as you can with the limited fuel you have. Not the most exciting gameplay, but I appreciate them trying new things to add more variety to these challenges. My favourites though have to be the races. These really showcase GT7 at its best. A lot of them have changeable weather, so strategy plays a big part, and many of the AI are programmed to use different tyre compounds and strategies, so it can be really unpredictable at times. Going back to update 1.11, one of the additions was a set of 8 one hour long mission races, and again these are mostly great, with a lot of them featuring changeable weather and opponents using different strategies to keep you on your toes. But this being GT7, it can't all be perfect. Starting with a minor gripe, the one lap magic events force you to sit through the whole countdown, just like GT4. Guys, I know many people consider GT4 to be the best game, but you didn't have to do that as well. I don't see why they couldn't give us the option to skip the countdown and just simulate where the cars would be by that time. Surely a PS4 or a PS5 can handle that. Now, there are a few key differences between normal races in the world circuits and mission races. The first is simply that mission events don't play music. Apart from this one, for some reason. Now that's some real driving music. So if you normally play with the music on, tough luck. The second is far more important. Mission events only give you a payout the first time that you complete them. That is a big deal, because it means that if you win a mission race, you won't get paid for any subsequent attempts. So, after completing these races once each, all of the good work they put into making them fun and unique goes completely out of the window. You can't justify spending a whole hour doing a race that gives you literally nothing when GT7 is a game where money is so important. There is no replay value to these races whatsoever, and that just sucks. Even when they succeed at something, they still manage to fail in some way. It's just unbelievable. And it's not as if making these as regular World Circuit races would make them OP for money grinding, because in the same update they introduced three races which give even better money versus time payouts, which we will get to. Also, the mission races that existed before update 1.11 have a ridiculously low payout for some reason, even compared with other much shorter mission events. It seems as though they may have realised this issue because in a later update they added another one hour long race, but to the world circuits instead, meaning it can be replayed for more money. But these human comedy races are still trapped in the purgatory that is the missions, and that's just sad. I've talked a few times now about update 1.11 and some of the changes implemented, but I've yet to even explain why this came about in the first place. I'm sure many of you will already know, but this occurred due to complaints from the community that GT7 was too much of a grind, as you couldn't earn much money, and combined with the insane cost of some cars, meant that collecting the cars you wanted became extremely difficult. It was update 1.07 where some of the best paying races were slashed down that really generated the backlash towards a game which even before the update didn't pay out a great amount. Combine this with the game's servers being down for almost a full day due to an issue with the update, and it was a PR nightmare for Gran Turismo. Needless to say, they needed to act fast, and only a couple of weeks later we got update 1.11. This provides context as to why they added the mission races and boosted the payouts for circuit experience. The point is that even though it was fairly easy to earn money early in the game, later in the game and certainly in the post game, the discrepancy between how many events there were to do and how much they paid out versus the cost of many of the higher end cars meant that grinding certain races over and over again was inevitable. At this point I'd like to just explain why forcing players into a situation where grinding is the only realistic way to obtain something is awful game design. There is a sentiment that I've seen from some people that grinding is just a natural part of playing a game and people who complain about it are just entitled and don't want to work hard or put in any effort for their reward. Now I can't speak for everyone on this but for me that's nowhere near the truth. Let's make a hypothetical. So, in situation A, you grind a single race over and over again for let's say two hours, 
because it's the best way to make money to buy a car you really want. So you grind for the two hours, you get the money and buy the car. Then in situation B, you have to win a really challenging set of events or even a championship, which takes twice as long, so four hours, and from that you win the same car. To me, situation B is far better and more rewarding, even though it takes double the time. The issue is not the effort you have to put in, but rather the way it's presented in the game. Giving players a unique challenge to earn something is much preferable than pretty much forcing them to replay an element over and over again if they want to buy it, even if that would be less time consuming and easier. This is where older GT games were so rewarding, because the idea of giving a reward based on a unique challenge was how they gave out prize cars. When you finished a 100% playthrough on those older games, you would have either won all of the cars, or have enough money by then to buy anything you wanted. Of course, not everyone will agree with that, and ultimately it's up to you to play the game in a way which you find the most enjoyable. If that's grinding the same race 20 times a day, then go for it. Even in a previous video, I talked about how I did the Clubman Cup Plus races a ridiculous amount of times, just because I find them fun. Not everything has to be about getting some sort of reward, but don't expect everyone to be on the same page. Giving people the choice between these two options would be the ideal outcome. And that's how it should be. But with GT7, there's nowhere near enough things to do for that to be a reality. And series producer Kazunori Yamauchi agrees with this. Or at least he says he does. In a statement he put out after the 1.07 disaster, he said, I want to make GT7 a game in which you can enjoy a variety of cars lots of different ways, and if possible, would like to try to avoid a situation where a player must mechanically keep replaying certain events over and over again. So the question is, why did they design the game in a way where this would be inevitable? They have the metrics, they know how much total money there is from completing every event, including prize cars, and they know how much every single car costs to buy. So why was anybody involved in the game even surprised that this happened? And that leads us to our next point. The issues with the missions and circuit experience are that they are only one-time payouts. So once they're done, you can't get the money again. That would normally be fine, but even after completing all of these, you're still going to need a lot more cash to buy many of the other cars. So after saying that they don't want players to mechanically keep playing certain events over and over again, their next course of action was to add three races for you to specifically keep replaying over and over again. Nice of them to add three, I suppose, but how do I know this for certain? Well, a couple of reasons. Firstly, the fact that they are by far the best in terms of a money to time ratio when compared to any other replayable event. Secondly, is that regardless of how you drive, whether you're smashing into opponents or cutting corners, you will still get the clean race bonus every single time. They're not particularly subtle about it. And thirdly, is that since then, 10 months later, they are still the best races to grind. Despite the game adding more races which use faster cars and are arguably harder, these are still the best options for making money efficiently. So in my mind, that part of it is obvious. You know, we've talked so much about grinding money that I forgot what we're even grinding for in the first place. Oh yeah, that's right. So like I've said, the cost of certain cars is frankly insane, but even beyond just the top 1%, the values have generally inflated quite a lot. I mean, 48 grand for a sprinter with 55,000 miles on the clock? What? Of course, a lot of this is down to the inflation of prices for certain cars in the real world, and Kazunori, in that same statement, made this link very clear. The pricing of cars is an important element that conveys their value and rarity, so I do think it's important for it to be linked with the real world prices. So my question to him is, why? Why is that important? That may sound like a stupid question, since from even the original Gran Turismo, the in-game prices have always somewhat reflected the real-world value of these cars, with those changing over time as well. The point is that GT7 pushes this to a ludicrous degree. I think now is a good time to take a look at how the value of real-world cars are determined, and try and relate this back to GT7. I've identified four main areas that impact a real car's worth. Firstly, condition. This one is easy in how it relates to GT7, because used cars with higher mileage generally will have a less durable engine and body, and as such are worth less to purchase when compared to an equivalent new car bought from Brand Central. So that's a tick for GT7. Secondly is performance. That's another easy one, as generally higher performance cars will be worth more in GT7. It's a racing game, so driving and winning with faster and faster cars is a clear goal. That makes sense. Thirdly, I have rarity. This is where things start to get messy, mostly because the rarity of a real car is a big deal. If a car is designed and built by a certain group of people at a certain period in time, that can never be fully replicated. In GT7, you can have an infinite amount of these cars existing, far more than the number that exists in real life, because it's a video game. That's kind of the point. 
This idea cannot be paralleled in a video game without artificially limiting the total supply of cars available to all players. Not that they should do that either, dear god no, but that's the concept. And the final point is desirability slash historical significance. Again, very contentious, since the reasons and motives for wanting a car in real life can be drastically different from a video game. If you get a 1930s Alfa Romeo in real life, that's a big f***ing deal. Even people who don't know anything about cars would be able to tell. Getting one in GT7 is not, because what the hell are you supposed to do with it? And the only reason why anyone would care is because of the value, not any significance attributed to the car itself. Arguably, it reduces the importance of the car itself because at that point it just becomes a number, something to flaunt and say, look what I have. The car itself becomes irrelevant, which, ironically, is the opposite of what they were trying to achieve. Now, not to say that any historical or even emotional value is completely irrelevant in a racing game. These cars are supposed to be facsimiles of the real thing, so any attachment or fondness towards a particular model should be reflected, like in real life. I'm not saying that you should find this Alpha in the used dealership selling for 30 grand or something purely because it's slow by modern standards and also has no utility in the game. It's more that the value shouldn't be so directly linked to the real world value when the connotations of how the car exists in the game are so drastically different than that of real life. The cost of cars is capped at 20 million credits, but you get the feeling that without this, some of them would be priced even higher than that. You know, I read a comment, which was somewhat written in jest, saying that GT7 is trying to mirror the real-life experience of classic-slash-prestigious car ownership. But honestly, the more I think about it, the more that idea seems to add up when you consider how GT7 is designed. Think about it, the cars are just sat in a dealership for a million billion credits waiting to be bought, and when someone finally does, they just put them in a garage where they can look at them, I guess. GT7 has very few events for these historic cars, so the main draw is clearly not to race them, even if in real life people can and often do. This is the only reason which justifies the decision they've made here, and if so, that's really sad. It would represent a fatal misunderstanding of how people interact with racing games and why they even enjoy them. Hint, a big part is the racing, not for some faux historic car ownership experience nonsense. Well, anyway, Gran Turismo has shown that they now value realism in the most mundane ways above engaging and fun game design. Realism and how a player is forced to interact with and rewarded in the game is clearly so important to them. So anyway, about roulette tickets. But you probably already knew that. So instead of giving out meaningful prizes, like cars which are relevant to the event or championship which you won, GT7 gives you a Forza Horizon wheel spin. Great. But that's not fair on Forza Horizon because actually they're much worse. These roulette tickets are given out near constantly. Complete a menu book? Here's a roulette ticket. What about these extra menus? Roulette tickets. Your daily reward for logging in and driving a certain distance? Roulette tickets. You don't need to go far to see that most people despise the roulettes, and that's mostly for one reason. They appear to be rigged to give you the worst prize almost every single time. The truth is that they're predetermined from pretty much the moment you get the ticket. This has been proven by people using their tickets and then restarting their game without saving. When they open the tickets again, their prizes are exactly the same. Now, I'm not against the idea of roulette prizes entirely. Of course, GT3 had roulettes as well when you won a championship. The difference is that in GT3, the roulette was between four prize cars which were specifically chosen as prizes for that event. It also was truly random, and if you wanted a different prize, you could redo the championship, thus adding replay value. Or just save scum. The only drawback was that a lot of the time, the prizes weren't exactly equivalent in terms of value or desirability, and that's how things like this happen. And this car... What is it? Ew! It's pink! It's a Toyota Vitz. It's pink! Why is it pink? What car do I get? I can win one of four cars. Oh, yeah. Not even gonna say it. Not even gonna say it. Fan fing tastic. That's an amazing prize. Another pink Vitz. Now well, let's see what car I get. Well, at least it's not pink.
So GT7 takes that part of it and turns it up to 11. As I said, the prizes are predetermined, meaning that the other prizes you see are just set dressing. Sometimes you will even see prizes which are literally not possible to attain for that grade of ticket. I should mention that tickets come in tiers, with one star tickets being the worst with the lowest value prizes, all the way up to six stars which give the best rewards. In terms of money, I don't really care that much, although it isn't much of a draw to keep playing and get your ticket every day, when you know the reward is almost guaranteed to be hardly anything. In fact, I've calculated that in some cases with the lower payouts, you actually receive less money per minute spending the time to just open the ticket and watch the animation than you get per minute from grinding the best paying races. Crazy. But for me, the real issue is the other prizes you can get. GT7 has the best customization of any GT game, and one of its key additions are engine swaps finally making their debut in the series. At present, there are tons of different interesting and unique engine swaps, and they're adding more of them every month. They really are an awesome part of the game which everyone can enjoy. You can probably see where I'm going with this. The only way to obtain them is pure luck. And needless to say, you're going to need a lot of luck. Back in June last year, there was an exploit which allowed you to redeem pretty much infinite engine swaps. This is how I and many other people managed to get so many of them as we stockpiled whilst we could. But if we take those out of the equation, playing the game how it was intended, I've won maybe 7 or 8 engine swaps total, in a game which at present has 55 possible engine swap combinations. I've played this game for over 450 hours, and that's all I would have. And this is with intervention from Polyphony. You see, they recognised how unbelievably lucky you needed to be to get an engine swap from a regular roulette ticket, and came up with a solution. Was it to change the method of getting them from entirely luck to something more skill-based? No, they just give out some tickets specifically for engine swaps now. And so, the trend of them identifying an issue, but rather than solving the root cause of it, they just plaster over it, and act as if it's no longer there, continues. Whilst this has helped a little, because without these I would only have two legitimate engine swaps that I can remember getting from regular tickets, not everybody is so lucky. So, the way of getting these engine swap only tickets is from completing extra menus. Oh boy, they're back again. Ironically, it was through these extra menus that the exploit for infinite tickets was found. The big problem is that a lot of these extra menus require you to get cars which can only be found from the used car or legends car dealership, meaning if you don't have it already, you have to wait days or sometimes even weeks to find the car you need. And in the worst cases, these are cars costing multiple millions of credits, which you might not even want, but need for the extra menu. And on top of that, the engine is decided at random, so you may end up with one you don't even want or need. So because of this, it really doesn't pass as anything close to a solution. Not to mention that we've now seen the possibility of needing cars for extra menus, which you can only get with a brand invitation. What's a brand invitation? Some of you may ask. That's a great question. I wish Polyphony would ask themselves the same thing. Essentially, certain high-end cars in Brand Central require these brand invitations for you to actually purchase them. Can you guess how you earn a brand invitation? Yeah, this makes the extra menu solution even more ridiculous. These invitations were also on a timer, meaning that you only had 14 days to get the money to buy the cars from the point you got the invitation. Again, pressuring you to buy cars you may not even want, because you have no idea when you'll get another opportunity to do so. Once again, there was a lot of criticism towards GT7 for this as well, and once again, in update 1.11, they implemented their solution. They extended the invitations from 14 days to 30 days. That was it. Are you surprised? With roulettes, you can also win cars, very rarely, and tuning parts for cars that you may not even have and would never want to own. These even include special parts like ultra-high RPM turbos and stage 5 weight reduction, and there are also special roulette tickets specifically for parts, which again, you can get from the extra menus. It goes without saying that this is the antithesis of good game design, and I hope I've conveyed that to you as well. Way to make your players feel like dirt who deserve nothing. You could be goddamn Igor Fraga and you'd still be subject to this shit. Not to mention how it completely contradicts the realism they're trying to create in other areas, like the car collecting. Okay, so I've got to save up 20 million to buy this historic car from the legendary car dealership, which I can't really use for anything. But if I want this Bugatti, I've got to get an invitation to buy it, which I can get by collecting other random cars, or just driving 26 miles in a day, and then playing a slot machine where I have a minute chance of getting it. Nothing is consistent to anything. It's like they're trying to jam together puzzle pieces which don't fit. They use the excuse of realism when they can make the game more tedious, but suddenly when some form of reality check would really help, that all goes out of the window. It's inconceivable. So, we've talked the length about the problems. What about some solutions? Uh, trash the roulette tickets and let you buy the engine swaps. Job done. 
Okay, it's not that simple. I imagine a big part of them doing all of this is to try and stretch the content over a longer period of time so that people will keep coming back for more. I don't imagine it's been very successful, but that seems like the idea. So any solution we come up with has to be with this in mind. Anyway, still trash the roulette tickets, and with the engine swaps, what we can do is to tie the unlocking of them to certain milestones for that particular car. So, say you want that 4 rotor in your RX-7. The challenge could be something like win 10 races with the RX-7, or win a specific championship, or even earn a certain amount of drift points in it, something like that. That way, you've got a reason to keep playing, so players will stay invested, and for a lot of people, if they really enjoy the car, they'll just unlock it naturally anyway. For the manufacturer invites, we could give these as rewards for certain relevant things, like collecting a certain amount of cars from a given brand, or winning a certain race for that brand. Like for winning the Ferrari challenge, you could get the invitation to buy the FXXK. Also, once you get the invitation, you could keep it forever. So no more feeling pressure to buy the car as soon as possible, or getting invitations for cars you already have. For the unique parts, it's not a big deal, but we could again tie this to some form of accomplishment with the car, much like the engine swaps. As we've now gotten rid of roulette tickets, we don't have any incentive for people to play daily. We could bring back the seasonal event races, although that's probably asking too much to have those daily, so they can be weekly or bi-weekly as they were before. In terms of daily incentive, we can make one chosen race from the world circuits have increased payouts. They don't have to be insanely high, but around the same level as the current best paying races, and this could be shown as the daily special, updating every 24 hours. As solutions, I think those will work pretty damn well. I mean, give me a call polyphony and I'll just design the whole game for you while I'm at it. Let me know what you guys think and also leave your own suggestions in the comments. But as far as it goes for GT7, a lot of what I've mentioned is how it fails to live up to previous titles and do things nearly as well as them. But the reality is that it should be doing things better and bringing new and interesting experiences. Beyond getting shafted by the roulettes, I mean. While it's managed to devolve in so many ways, it hasn't really brought anything fresh to the table to offset that either, and there's no shortage of ideas. Here's an easy one larger grids and multi-class racing. This isn't even entirely new because they did dabble with it in GT Sport, where there were a couple of multi-class races and one that even featured a 30-car grid. Now it's possible that having GT7 on PS4 as well meant a trade-off had to be made here, but that is giving them the benefit of the doubt that it was even on their radar. Maybe they were just laser focused on getting ray tracing and replays instead or some other shit like that which nobody cares about. Even upping it to a 24-car grid I would have expected since they managed to do that on GT Sport briefly for even online races. Back in the day, at the end of every FIA season, they would have these top 24 superstars races for the best drivers in the region. I was actually fortunate enough to have competed in one of these as well. And when it comes to multi-class racing, the best we have on GT7 is a couple of missions, which I guess are multi-class. But maybe that's for the best, since the AI clearly weren't programmed with that in mind. It seems like the slower a car is going, the more trouble they have trying to overtake. It's bizarre. I know I should have mentioned this in the AI video, but here we are. Anyway, I was recently watching some gameplay from GT5 Prologue and saw something quite interesting. Well, aside from the fact that basically all of the menu music from there is reused in GT7, what I saw was an event type that's never returned to the series since then. The event was sort of like a time trial, but the difference was that you had 10 minutes to beat the lap time and there were other cars on the circuit as well. It sort of reminded me of a time attack session. This alone is interesting, but really they could take this even further such as instead of aiming for a set lap time, you have to beat the opponent's lap times. They could even have whole events and championships based on this. Obviously, it won't appeal to everyone, and would probably just end up as a mission, but still, it's those sort of interesting ideas I was hoping to see more of in GT7. But all we got to spice up the experience was nonsense like this. If it's not clear enough, I'll state it now. Gran Turismo 7 had the potential to be the greatest racing game of all time, and even despite the never-ending series of blunders it seems to go through, it's still decent. The base they're working with is simply incredible in terms of its technical output, but in almost every design decision, it seems to take the wrong turn and sabotages itself in truly unbelievable ways. So, what was the goal? I find myself asking this so often with respect to GT7. With actually good games, the goal is obvious, to make the game as fun and rewarding for the player as possible, and all design decisions are centred around that. Clearly, this is not the case for GT7. So, an obvious one we've mentioned is to keep players coming back. GT7 has been described as a live service, meaning that it will be consistently updated over time, and new things will keep being added to draw players back in. It also explains a lot of these bizarre design choices in terms of actual content and rewards, since they're trying to stretch the player experience over a longer period of time. But 
you don't need to look far to see the flaw with this logic, because if they don't add new content regularly, or the new content they do add isn't very interesting, then the game is basically dead in the water. As we've seen when there was no January updates, and even when there has been updates, it hasn't done much to improve the state of the game. Most months you can get through the new content in about an hour, and that's all there is. Now, this wouldn't be a big deal if GT7 was a complete game from the get-go, but as we've seen, it is far from that, so it kind of lives and dies by its post-launch support. And that support hasn't been particularly strong. Each month, we get a handful of cars and very occasionally a new track, which I don't have too many issues with. People can and often do complain endlessly about which cars and tracks they want in the game, but to me, the issue is not what they do add, but rather what they don't add to the game. Through none of the recent updates have they solved any real issues with the game, or even given the impression that they might, and nothing they add feels fresh or gives players a new experience. Going back to update 1.11, where they added a new set of mission races, we were promised that there was plenty more to come. Ten months later and we're still waiting for anything new or meaningfully different, whilst they just keep recycling the same bland style of races over and over and over again. Clearly, Gran Turismo 7 is not alone in this. Looking at video games as a whole, this is the approach that many franchises have switched over to, and very few of them pull it off well. And it's not as if this is the only option. You only need to look back at games like GT3 and GT4 in particular, that are still widely played and talked about even decades later. The staying power of these well-designed and fully fleshed out games is immense. Now, imagine if they could design a game like this, and then support it with additional content adding new and interesting experiences. The results would be incredible. But simply put, it seems like they don't want to put the effort in to do that, so instead they defer to the cheap tactics that we've seen to keep people hooked. And this doesn't even seem to be working. I've received countless comments from people stating that they've given up on GT7 and sometimes even the Gran Turismo series as a whole, and to be honest, I can't blame them. When it feels like they've implemented mechanics to make the experience worse, and then refuse to change or even accept any form of feedback on this, many players will understandably not stick around. It's not a coincidence that pretty much all YouTubers covering GT7 focus on the online stuff, because at the moment, that part of the game is the only thing that holds any value to most players. Since I'm pretty burnt out on online racing from GT Sport, I don't really have much to do. Even if there are more cars to collect, I respect my time too much to waste it just grinding, which I've already done a fair amount of. To be honest, the only thing that keeps me coming back at this point are the time trials, where I can earn an easy couple of million, and they keep me from getting too rusty. Now, I imagine through the course of these past couple of videos, there'll be people practically screaming at their screens by this point with one thing in mind. What about the microtransactions? The narrative for a lot of people, and certainly this was the case with the complaints just after launch, was that GT7 was designed like this specifically to force people towards buying in-game credits, and was entirely fueled by greed. So, this isn't going to make me very popular, but to be frank, I don't agree with this. For the most part, at least. To be clear, I don't blame anyone for feeling this way, and certainly the evidence for this argument is very strong. Having the prices for a lot of cars jacked up to insane amounts, having races which don't pay out very much, and then even reducing those payouts as well, it's obvious to see why people thought this way. And combine this with seeing this happen to many other games before, there was very little trust to go on. So, while I think this is mostly a misunderstanding, I do not feel sorry for them whatsoever, since they brought this entirely on themselves. Hiding the cost of these microtransactions from reviewers, and only revealing them after the fact, was a very scummy thing to do, as was reducing the payouts. Although it didn't really make sense for this random dirt race to be the best moneymaker, hence why they nerfed it, the fact that they didn't replace it or increase payouts for many other events was incredibly short-sighted, and that's entirely on them. But as for the accusations, Firstly, an incredibly stupid one was that GT7 was pay to win. Pay to win what? This classic car which I can't even do anything with? It is by definition not a pay to win game. As for the more grounded complaints, let's have a look at the pricing of cars. So regarding this statement from Kazunori about reflecting the real world prices of cars, whilst I completely disagree with it, as I've stated, I 100% accept that this is truly what he believes. Whilst others may view it as a cop out or an excuse, to me, it seems to line up with his vision for the series. We will talk about his vision another time, I am sure, because that's a whole other can of worms. I think part of the problem was that it escalated beyond just the realm of racing games and into the wider gaming sphere. To people who've never played a Gran Turismo game, and never even heard of Kazunori or Polyphony Digital. This meant that a lot of assumptions were made, and a lot of those were that the creators had bad intentions with all of this. 
Let me just say that I started playing this series with GT3 back in the early 2000s and have kept up to date with it almost religiously since about 2009 on the run up to the release of GT5. This includes reading and watching basically every article and interview about the games that I could possibly get my hands on. And what that means is that over the past decade and a half that I've been following the series, what most people would agree to be the most turbulent era of the series, I feel like I've got a pretty decent handle on how Kazunori thinks and makes decisions. Or at least I think I do. One thing I know for certain is that when he makes a design choice, he does so with the utmost conviction. In his mind, he has come to a conclusion and formed a vision of where the series should go and what the game should be like, and will not be convinced otherwise. This is the reason why Gran Turismo came to be in the first place, and also became so great, but also how some of the most baffling ideas for the series came about. A recent example is with the car valuation service. People had been desperate to sell cars in GT7, for various reasons, and it took months for them to finally implement a seemingly very simple feature. But instead of a simple sell car for percentage of what you paid system, they developed this dynamic in-game ecosystem where prices fluctuate based on market trends. An interesting idea, but not one many people were asking for. In practice, it functions fairly similar to the old way, as you're always paid a bit less than what the car is actually worth. It also makes you wonder how they determine price changes for cars which don't actually exist and never have. Kazunori's idiosyncratic way of thinking often leads to ideas and mechanics that nobody else would realistically think to put in a racing game, and combined with a real lack of transparency, tends to lead towards missed expectations and general confusion. All of this is to say, I can envision a version of GT7 where microtransactions were never even mentioned in the design process, but the game still ended up the exact same way. The assumption has been that they're only in the game at the request of the higher-ups at Sony, but this can't be proven for certain. I will say that through my research, Kazunori and Polyphony have never struck me as being so money-oriented, just more interested in reaching as many players as they can. Essentially, I'm arguing for incompetence rather than greed and deception on the part of Polyphony. I mean, you have to admit, if you still genuinely believe that all of this was fueled entirely by greed, they have done a monumentally bad job of designing the game around this either. Think about it, the cars which are so overpriced, the main crux of all of this, have no purpose in the game. There's no reason to need them, and unless you have an attachment or interest in a particular model already, the game gives you no reason to even want them. You could remove all of the cars from the Legends dealer from the game entirely, and nothing would change. It's almost as if they designed the whole thing so you wouldn't want to buy or own any of them. It's just incredible. And also with other decisions. How does making the game extremely linear and boring make people want to buy credits? The lack of original events, how does that play into it? Even the roulette tickets with its maddening false realities don't seem to fit. I mean, if you could buy roulette tickets, thank f they didn't do that by the way, but if they did, then you could at least say, oh okay, then they're just money hungry bastards then. But they didn't, and that's what makes their inclusion even more dumbfounding. What was the point of any of this? If I had to make a top 10 list of the weirdest design decisions in racing games that I've ever played, GT7 would have like 8 or 9 of those. If you're ever playing GT7 and wonder to yourself, why doesn't this feel as fun as the older games, or at least as fun as it should be, just remember this video. Because even if the mainstream and game reviewers don't value game design in racing games, GT7 proves that it matters a whole lot more than they can ever imagine. Did you think I was finished? Gran Turismo 7 is one of those games which I could just talk about forever. Even though we've already covered a lot of the main areas of the game that have the most egregious issues, especially when comparing them to the previous titles, there is still a whole lot more to talk about, as you can see from the runtime of this video. For a game which on the surface appears so polished and refined, it's incredible just how many areas of it are not, beyond even the main single player experience which I've already covered in detail. For a series which prides itself on its attention to detail, GT7 manages to get a lot of those details wrong. We're talking about a general lack of polish, areas where clearly not enough effort has been put in, features features which are outdated, broken, and in some cases, missing altogether. Now, if you're one of those people who complains about nitpicking when others make critiques, then this video is not for you, because there's going to be a lot of those. If it were just one or two things, then sure, they wouldn't really be worth mentioning. It would be like me talking about how it's annoying that when you take a car which can't have custom wheels to GT Auto, they don't grey out the option for the wheels like they do with the other modifications, so you're just hit with disappointment when you go into the menu and realise that you can't put any of them on. I mean, that would be ridiculous. I've never put a complaint that hyper-specific into one of my videos. Oh. 
wait a second. Anyway, not to say that the previous games were completely flawless, but with GT7 you'll find a mixture of issues, from ones that have played the series for decades to new problems they seemingly invented just for GT7. These sorts of things won't be that apparent if you just play it occasionally, but if you are quite invested in the game and the series as a whole, it will grind you down over time. Let me show you what I mean. Let's talk about video game soundtracks. If you were to ask most fans of racing games, they would probably tell you that they're not as good as they once were. One recent game in particular has taken quite a lot of flack for its in-game music. Regardless of what you think about that, it's clear that the days of games like Ridge Racer Type 4 are sadly a very distant memory. If you've seen my video about the music of Gran Turismo, you'll know that this matters quite a lot to me. That video focused mainly on the music from the first four games, and the work of one composer in particular, who I adore and think is sorely underrated. Check it out if that sounds interesting. So with GT7, it isn't a case of the soundtrack just not being to people's tastes, or not being as good as the older games, although you can of course make that argument. No, the issues, much like many other things about the game, are a lot more complicated than that. Firstly, let's talk about the in-race soundtrack, the music you hear when you're actually driving. There are 58 songs in total, which is quite a lot, but if you're not a fan of Daiki Kasho, then you're pretty much f***ed. Fortunately, I do like Daiki Kasho's songs, so not a big issue for me, right? Well, here's the kicker. None of this is new music. Not even remixes or remasters, these are songs which have been carried through from Gran Turismo 4, 5 and 6. The same songs which we've been listening to for literal decades. And it's not just Kasho's songs, there's tons of reused stuff from Nitoko Inoue, Masahiro Ando and other artists as well. You might not be familiar with their names, but if you play the older games like GT4 through 6, you'll be very familiar with their work. The thing is that I actually like a lot of the music, but at this point it's just so stale and makes the game feel a lot more dated than it actually is. Even if you haven't played the older games, this will be quite apparent how out of touch it seems to sound. I'm not against them reusing some music, the best and most memorable songs in the franchise would be cool to keep, but this is taking it too far. In fact, 75% of the in-race music is reused from the older games. 75%. It makes it feel like a best of album rather than a newer fresh experience if you ask me. You might look at this and say, sure it reuses a lot of music, but we should look at that stuff as a bonus on top of the new music we have in GT7. If you don't want to hear the old stuff, then just turn them off. So, what about the new stuff then? Well, when we take out the reused music, we are left with a grand total of... 14 songs. For context, the PAL in-race soundtrack for Gran Turismo 3 back in 2001 had 17 songs, all of which being new to the series at that point. The PAL soundtrack is the one I grew up with and I think it's excellent, but you know what was also really good? The North American soundtrack for GT3, which had 25 songs. And check this out, only 5 songs were used in both versions of GT3, so when you add it all together, they had 37 unique songs. Most of that fully licensed and a handful created for the game, all never before heard in the series at that point. GT7 has 14. If they could do that back then, why not now? Whether it be due to time constraints or they just didn't really care, either way it comes off as very lazy. But hey, maybe it's quality over quantity, right? No. To be clear, I don't hate these new songs. I think Life's Coming In Slow by Nothing But Thieves is awesome and for me by far the standout, and there are a couple of other good ones, but it's mostly pretty forgettable. The only others that I remember are because of their meme potential, or for making me think that this soundtrack is actually a cry for help from the people working at Polyphony. What are they doing? Moving on to the menu OST, the issue is similar but slightly different. There are a whopping 170 songs used in the various menus, with 74 of those being all new to GT7. Still, not a great percentage versus what's been reused, but still better than the in-race music, and 74 brand new songs is pretty impressive. But how then does it manage to feel even more stale and repetitive than the in-race music? The main problem seems to be bloat. The soundtrack does not need 170 songs, especially when almost 100 of them are again the same tired old lounge music we've been hearing since GT5 Prologue. And again, a lot of this music is quite good, and I know a lot of other people really enjoy them as well, but they really need to give it a break. It just feels so stuck in the past and like the series hasn't moved on from the PS3 era. But the strange thing is, even though there's plenty of new music to offset this, whenever I boot up the game I almost always get one of these old reused songs. How come? This takes us to our next issue, which is how and where the music is used. 
So, unlike the in-race music, I think the new music for the menus is generally pretty good. Of those 74 new songs, most of it was composed by Lenny Ibizar, especially for GT7. Now, Lenny had featured quite heavily on the GT Sports soundtrack as well, but from what I can tell, most of his music wasn't made for GT Sports. And being honest, I didn't think it was very good. This was mostly down to the application. Ambient music is not my thing, and I don't think it works very well in a racing game either. I mean, there were songs that had animal cries and other weird noises, it was very strange. Anyway, his original songs for GT7 are miles better in my opinion. They feel modern and give the game a fresh twist, while also having that signature groove that was so prevalent in the first few games. Check out his songs Epic U, Event Horizon, Computers Have Control and New York Dub to see what I mean. Alongside his original music, he also did some remixes of classical pieces, some of which are quite interesting, as we've heard, but his version of Adagio for Strings is pretty good. The point is that his music only gets heard in a few menus, such as for Sport Mode and the Mission Events, similar to the new music by other artists in places like Brand Central and the License Center. To me, these menus have by far the best music, with very little of it being reused, but most of them are places in the game where you don't spend a huge amount of time. Conversely, the main map and world circuits menu, where you're likely to spend most of your time outside of racing, is where they use so much of the music from the past games. It's really frustrating. A very painful example of this is with what I think is Lenny's best song on the soundtrack called Galabria. I'd recommend listening to it in full, it's incredible, maybe even the best song in the entire game. So, where does it get used? The pre-race menu for one championship. That's it. A menu which you're not likely to spend any more than 20 seconds in. That is f***ing criminal. Remember the cover of Moon Over the Castle by Beyond the Horizon, which they hyped up massively before the launch and featured a lot in the promotional material for the game? Same thing, pre-race music for the final championship. It does work, but the fact it's only heard in that one specific place and nowhere else is just astounding. I've heard the song more times on the run-up to the release of the game than I've heard it in the 500 hours I've spent playing the game since it came out. Ridiculous. But actually, there is one other place where you can hear these songs. The music replay. You know, that feature in the game which you only now remember because I just mentioned it. That one. There are also a few songs which are exclusive to the replay modes, like a couple of Daiki Kasho songs from GT3, and also another classical remix by Lenny. There's a very good chance that even if you put hundreds of hours into this game, you would have never heard this song. That's because, like I say, hardly anyone uses the music replay, and also, the only two places I could find it re-uploaded, it has a combined viewing of about 700. But plenty of games have hidden and unused music, so what makes GT7 so different? Well, in the case of most other games, they're not placing their most overused songs from the past front and centre, whilst having the new and interesting stuff hidden away in the corner for hardly anyone to see. I mean, most people would have no need or want to even interact with sport mode, yet that's where a lot of this new original music is. It would be like the machine test from GT3 having all of the great songs, like Light Velocity and Slipstream, and then the main GT mode and Go Race menus stretch thin with mostly reused stuff from GT1 and 2. In a lot of ways, you can draw parallels between the music and the cars and tracks in GT7. It stems from a mismanagement of the assets. In the same way that there are tracks which only have one or two races with tons of unused variations, and cars which have basically no proper events to race them in, there's plenty of new and original music which hardly gets used. You would think that since they spent the time and money to create and license these songs that they would want to use them as much as possible, but seemingly they don't and I can't understand why. But do you know what goes hand in hand with the music? 
the visual design. It's been a bit of a running joke that recently, racing games are where visual design goes to die. Most are very bland and uninspired, and in some cases very cumbersome to use. To be fair, GT7 is by far not the worst in this department, it does actually try, but there are a few places where it kinda doesn't. Do you like grey on grey? Well, I've got some great news. So for Brand Central, they made this really cool 3D environment and used it for one cutscene and the background for one menu book collection. That was it. What they did instead for the Brand Central menu was to just copy over the one from GT Sport and paste that on. You can actually see this 3D environment faintly in the background, but that's all you get. On the topic of reusing assets from GT Sport, here's the heads-up display. It's almost identical. I didn't expect them to completely redesign it from the ground up, but coming from GT Sport to GT7, it just feels exactly the same, despite a difference of five years and a whole console generation. They only did the bare minimum, adding a gauge for track water depth and a wind speed indicator. With the return of variable time, they didn't even bother to add an in-game clock, despite having the functionality for that, as you can see when you drive a car that has a visible clock in the interior. If you already programmed it, why not just put it on the main HUD? From reusing so many of these basic things, including the music, it almost seems like they hope people didn't play the previous games, despite trying to appeal directly to those people, as we can see from the obvious nostalgia bait in the trailers. However, something that is completely new is the main GT mode map. Honestly, it's pretty nice. My only issue is that they already made a better one. This will be personal preference, but I think the one they showed off in the announcement trailer for GT7 is more subtle and more beautiful. I think what's worth noting with this menu is that it doesn't have a visual style as such, it's just trying to look sort of realistic. The problem they can have is that in 15-20 years it will appear very dated, whereas GT4's stylized design still looks as good as it did in 2005. I mean, that is assuming people can even play GT7 at that point in the future, but still. Speaking of lacking a visual style, here's the garage. I hate it. That may seem over the top, but let me explain. It's one of those things which I've disliked more and more over time. So essentially, we're in a grey lifeless void whilst classical music is playing. Does anything about this scream garage? The grey void, as I call it, has been around pretty much from the start of Gran Turismo, but I'm not really sure why they decided to bring it back now. In fact, if you leave the main menu for a few minutes, you'll see a cinematic of a random car in a proper garage environment. If they made this, why don't they use it for the actual garage instead of this eternal void? Here, this is a mock-up I made of how it would look, and with more fitting music. I don't know about you, but I think this is leagues better. Ever since probably GT5 Prologue, the series has tried to push this art house feel to make you appreciate cars as more than just mechanical machines. Whilst I get what they're trying to do, it just doesn't work. This seems like the reasoning for why the garage feels like some sort of grandiose art museum where we're admiring a Da Vinci, but in reality it's a Honda Fit. It's really starting to feel like a parody of itself. This is why some people say GT has gotten pretentious, and based on this evidence, it's hard to argue against that. So we've talked about more thematic ideas with the music and visual design, but what about some more functional design choices? Well, how about painting your car? That's a simple one. Gran Turismo has always been a bit behind the curve when it comes to this sort of thing. I mean, you couldn't even repaint your car until GT5 from 2010, and that was only allowed through this frustrating paint collection system, where you would only get paint to use from the different cars you earned, and if you used it once, then it was gone. GT7 has moved on from this quite a bit, with way more customization options and a fully-fledged livery editor. This part of the game is honestly one of the best things about it. Even still, it does manage to mess up something very simple, repainting your car. Let's have an example. Here's my Honda Integra, and I want to repaint it in championship white. So let's go to GT Auto and do just that. First step is to buy the paint of course. The first problem is that for some reason you can't preview the paint on your current car and the game instead loads these three other cars to preview it, even though my actual car model is already loaded right there. GT5 had something similar, wherein it would preview the paint on a model instead of the car. They fixed this for GT6, but have now made it worse again. Great. After buying the paint, the obvious thing would be to have an option to apply it then and there, but GT7 doesn't allow this, so you have to go into the livery editor and do it there. But when I try and repaint it, this happens. Yep, it removed the Type R decal. Why? 
I'm not trying to create a livery, just do a simple repaint. The same thing happens when you have cars with two-tone paint and stripes. It's really annoying, and I don't know why they don't have it as an option to remove them instead of being the default. But after that, we then have to find the specific paint we've bought and apply it. And then we're done. Nope, now you have to name your livery. Even though I'm just repainting the car, not making a full livery. Then it needs to save and apply it to your car. And then when you leave GT Auto, it needs to save again. And now we're finally done. Do you see how GT7 manages to take something so simple and make it so frustrating and time consuming? It's a mixture of issues from previous games and new problems that are specific to GT7. Doing it once is bad enough, but imagine having to do this every single time you just want to repaint a car. It's infuriating. A new paint option for GT7 is carbon paints, which look like these. A great option to have, but some genius at Polyphony decided that you can only use it to repaint the whole body. So if you want to have just a carbon fibre bonnet or wing, you're not allowed, because the whole car needs to be painted. Unless you feel like then doing a decal wrap over everything else, which is time consuming, and also means you're limited to the few decal surface options, so no metallic paint, chrome, etc. The term I've always used for things like this is pointlessly restrictive. Throughout the history of Gran Turismo, there have always been design decisions which fit this term. For example, in GT4, concept cars aren't allowed in most events. They had been allowed in the games before and since, and there's no functional reason as to why they can't be allowed, so pointlessly restrictive. In GT5 and 6, you weren't allowed to put custom wheels on racing cars, even though you could in all of the games before that, they just removed the ability to do so. Again, pointlessly restrictive. Polyphony are the kings of making their games less enjoyable with no obvious explanation. I can't see any technical reason why they wouldn't allow carbon paint to be used on any part, including wheels, so this is just another one on the pile. But whilst we're on the topic of not allowing people to do things, how about we talk missing features? You see, between GT Sport and GT7, a bunch of useful stuff was cut out of the game. One of those being basically all the telemetry from the replays. I'm sure only a fraction of people use this stuff in GT Sport, but it was quite useful for competitive races. Racing, so why they decided to trash all of it for GT7 is beyond me. Same thing with the position chart, which you can see at the end of each race in sport. It was always interesting to look at and observe where people were at any given point in a race, but again, it's gone from GT7. Back to replays, and GT Sport actually had two options for replay cameras, standard and variable. Standard is a mix of dynamic angles, both far and near, whereas variable is a lot more focused on the cars themselves. GT7 took out the variable option. Why? Again, no idea, but it means that sometimes when you're trying to get a decent angle on something, the game just refuses and gives you the least useful shot it can possibly find. The main reason why I bring this up though, is that we saw the consequences of this change on no bigger a stage than the grand final of the Nations Cup World Series. These are the final few corners of the final lap with three cars battling for the win. Take a look at this. Incredible. The most intense moment from the World Series, maybe ever, ruined by a tree, because the camera angle that the game chose was absolute sh**. This was extremely funny to me. To be honest, it's much a human error as anything, since I'm sure the directors for this event could have manually chosen a different angle, but for some reason they didn't. Okay, now it's time for a lightning round. Let's go. Firstly, in time trial, even if you select the same time of day and weather, the track conditions will be slightly different each time. Some would say that the whole point of time trial is to benchmark yourself for different cars in the same conditions, so it completely defeats the point when the track temperature and wind direction can be totally different between runs. Another is that when searching for things like liveries and decals on the community tab, you can't sort them in any order, such as most liked, recent, etc. The order you get seems to be a confusing mixture between most popular and most recent. Other games have done this far better, I don't know why this is so difficult. The livery editor has an excellent free moving camera feature, allowing you to see any part of a car in detail. For some reason though, they don't use this feature in any other part of the game. It would be great in places like the garage or the dealerships to check out a car before buying it, all we get in those places are an assortment of scapes and movies, which are chosen at random, and an extremely slowly rotating camera which takes 10 years to get round to the back of the car. 
I often enjoy watching the intros to games to get hyped up before I play them. Unfortunately, you can't really do that for GT7 because it's really f***ing long, and half of it is the slow build-up going through the history of cars. GT's intros have gradually gotten more drawn out over time, and at this rate, I wouldn't be surprised to see the intro of GT8 be a two-hour documentary about how they made the game. The performance point, or PP system, is completely busted for a number of reasons. The original goal was to be able to measure the relative performance of any car in any state of tune, so that you can see how small adjustments will affect the performance of your car. This became very easy to exploit, so they had to backpedal, and now tuning the transmission, differential and suspension has no impact to the performance point level. Aerodynamics still do, however, and you can see here how easily it can still be exploited. Also, individual tyre compounds within the same grade, like racing hard, medium, etc, have different PP levels based on the grip of the tyre. This completely ignores the whole point of the different tyre compounds, which is that the raw speed is a trade-off with tyre life. This means in a PP limited event where tyre wear will be a factor, there is literally no reason to not choose the hardest compound of tyres and then make up the rest of the PP deficit by upgrading your car so it's no slower than cars with the softer compounds but has way more durable tyres. And they made the wet and intermediate tyres have a lower PP than the dry tyres, even though this PP level is surely relative to its performance in the dry, when you would never use these tyres anyway, so that doesn't make any sense. Same thing with dirt tyres. They reduced the PP level when compared to regular racing tyres, but that must be based on its speed on tarmac, where you literally cannot even use them. Speaking of upgrades, am I the only person who finds that the majority of the time when I try and upgrade a road car, it normally makes it harder to drive? And I'm not just talking about adding power, even handling upgrades like better tyres and suspension can cause this. In the worst cases, it almost feels like the car is steering itself and my inputs are merely just the suggestion. Of course, fine-tuning can make it better, but a lot of the time cannot fix the issue completely. In my opinion, the base setup you get with things like the suspension should just work as standard, and any fine-tuning should be to optimise it and make it faster. I've spent countless hours doing this in GT6, and that's exactly how it worked, but in GT7, it feels like so many cars are just straight up broken when you do the same upgrades. I don't really understand. So, my final topic for this video is the car list. I know that I've ragged on people before for complaining about the car list because it's a very easy thing to do and I don't believe it's that important when compared to many other issues with the game. Ultimately, no matter what Polyphony does, there will always be people whining that this or that car isn't included, but that doesn't mean that there aren't any valid complaints about it. Personally, one that annoyed me is how they brought back versions of the JGTC Supra and R34 GTR, but not the NSX, which would round out the trio of old school GT500 cars and is also my favourite. That one's a bit rude, but if the leaked car list is to be believed, then we should be getting the Castrol Mugen NSX back at some point, as well as many others. But a more wider complaint is that GT7's car list already feels outdated and lacks many newer models. Updates included, as of now, there are only seven cars from model year 2021 and onwards, excluding Vision GT cars and fictional racing variants. Of course, a big part of this is down to how long it takes to model each car. Nine months is how long. As technology and techniques have improved, so has the time required to create these ultra detailed models. Back in the PS2 days, it would only take a single month for one designer to model a car from scratch. A trend that I've seen among certain people and outlets is heaping praise onto the game for its detail and immersion, and of course the recent release of VR for GT7 has only added to that, but a lot of them are the same people who were drone on endlessly about the lack of newer cars and their favourites not being included in the game. How can people not realise these two things are directly related? You can't have one without making sacrifices to the other. Anyway, this hyperfixation on detail has led to what I like to call the two-year tax. The premise is simple. From the point the game was released, you'll find very few cars from the past two years included. This started to become more obvious with GT5, where a large number of the new cars, racing cars in particular, capped out at 2008, despite the game releasing in 2010. When the new breed of GT500 cars were introduced into GT Sport, they were again two years out of date. The worst offender was the Lexus RCF, which was retired at the end of the 2016 season and superseded by the Lexus LC500. Despite GT Sport releasing in October 2017, it took another six months before these cars were included in an update. They were already outdated when they arrived, and five years later we're still waiting for their replacements. 
So if we look at the car list of say Gran Turismo 3, and again look for cars from the past two years, so model years 2000 and 2001, we can find a whopping 69 cars. Again, with no fictional racing variants included or multiple versions of the same car. That obviously blows GT7's 7 out of the water, and even if we give GT7 an advantage to offset the time needed to make the cars and include model year 2020 as well, this only rises to 13 cars, including DLC. So it's clear that even without the time investment needed to make these cars, that they don't have too much of a priority to keep the car list current. But why is that? Well, it seems like because all of the modern contemporary cars were carried over from GT Sport, they don't see much a need to keep them updated, and instead focus on expanding the car list in other areas. When you see a car in GT7, which is a model year 2014, 2015, 2016, more often than not, these will be the type of cars I'm talking about. But when you look and see that the newest McLaren is from back in 2016, then it isn't really good enough. Sadly, there aren't many solutions to this issue. Suggesting that Gran Turismo should start lowering the quality of these models to be able to make more would be foolish to anyone who's familiar with the developers. We can only really hope that as the quality of the models have reached a point of diminishing returns, that the focus is now on to how to produce them quicker rather than adding even more detail. Some car models made for GT Sport were outsourced, so hopefully this can be continued longer term. Or polyphony can just hire more employees. Anyway, all of this effort is worthless unless they're adding cars that people want to use and actually hold some sort of value in the game. But Kazunori has now admitted that SUVs are going to be included going forwards simply because they're driven quite often in real life, but not on racetracks and not by people who have any taste. We truly are living in the worst timeline. Okay, now it's time for the big one. How did Gran Turismo 7 end up the way that it did? If we were to boil it down to the most simplified explanation, the root cause that dictates almost every poor decision made with the game, then this is it. Gran Turismo 7 was not designed with fun as a priority. Some of you may already know that and think that it's obvious, and others may be confused as to why I think that a game which aims to simulate driving is not designed to be fun, despite the act of driving, to many of us, being one of the most enjoyable things out there. I want you to take this idea of GT7 not being made with the aspect of enjoyment in mind and just hold on to that as we talk about the game further. One of the key themes that I've taken away from GT7 is sacrifice. What do I mean by that? Well, a common idea for people who played the older GT games was that wouldn't it be awesome if we could have a game like this but with super realistic graphics and handling, but what was never talked about was what would need to be sacrificed to make that a reality. One obvious thing is of course the time needed to produce it, most obviously with the car models. I've mentioned this before, how the time needed to make each car increases, and as such the car list becomes dated much quicker and overall doesn't feel quite as connected to the car culture and motorsport of today, whereas in the older games, where cars could be pumped out at a much faster rate, including cars of that time, those games felt a lot more attached to the zeitgeist of what was really new and interesting back then. If you look at the tracks, there are more sacrifices, not only relating to the sheer number and relevance due to how long it takes to make them, but also in what form they take. The fact that beyond the real world circuits, a lot of the new originals have a fairly similar template of being fast and open with plenty of hard braking zones, and many of the returning originals have been modified to bring them more in line with this ethos as well. This was done mostly to better suit them for online racing and sport mode in particular. I made a more in-depth review of the whole situation as a separate video, so take a look if that sounds interesting. A few people also raised my attention to an interview with series producer Kazunori Yamauchi in which he explains why there is such a lack of proper street circuits in GT7, which relates to how much time, effort and resources needs to be put in to make them. Due to the sheer amount of detail required to make a street circuit in a built-up area to today's standards, Kazunori equates it to making five permanent circuits, so currently it simply isn't worth doing. Very sad considering the importance and history that circuits like these have had in the series in the past, and yet another sacrifice made to the mores of increasing visual fidelity and immersion. But beyond purely just the visual stuff, there are more losses for the sake of realism. Another that I've covered is car collecting, how many classics and cars that are rare in real life have their prices jacked up to insane amounts and then shoved in a legendary dealership only for you to save up the cash, purchase them and realise they're almost entirely useless in the game. It mirrors reality, yes, but from a game design standpoint, it's absolute dog shit. 
And what's truly incredible is how they recognised this issue in the older games, and as such handled these types of cars in a way that felt more natural and rewarding. Car collecting I feel is a really core idea of Gran Turismo, hence why my first video in this series was about that. The idea I really wanted to convey, and may not have done fully, come on it was my first proper video after all, was that collecting cars in and of itself doesn't have any inherent meaning, but the context in which you earn them, and the ways in which you can then use them, add to that meaning. Of course, some people will enjoy collecting cars for the sake of collecting and no other reason, and that's totally fine, but the issue comes in where the game is then designed around that specific way of playing. Car collecting in GT7 is completely shallow because there's very little context to the act of collecting and then enjoying what you've collected, the cars. You don't need to be a game designer to understand this, but it can help to explain it. その how polyphony doesn't seem to grasp this, I'm not sure I'll ever understand. Also, having permanent modifications is a bit weird and I'm not really sure how to feel about it. On one hand, it is again realistic and means that you need to think more about what you choose to upgrade, but on the other hand, it makes the game more restrictive and you can end up with bias remorse, like when you put a wide body on De Tomaso Mangusta because you thought that was a good idea, somehow. It means that I often end up having multiple versions of my favourite cars, which just seems wasteful. You have to look at each of these sacrifices sacrifices and ask yourself, is this really worth it? Clearly, Polyphony seems to think so, but I don't believe that it's as black and white as they make it out to be. But of course, realism doesn't explain all of the issues here. In fact, in some cases, an injection of realism would really help. Putting GT Sophie to one side, as it's just a gimmick for now, the normal AI is terrible, mostly, and the unrealistic racing scenarios that the game puts them in really doesn't help. And neither does drastically altering their pace depending on their position relative to the player. Roulette tickets, they're just like real life, where you have the chance to win a whole engine or rare part that can't be obtained anywhere else, but you actually just end up with someone's pocket change instead. I don't think you can make a better advertisement to discourage gambling if you try. As you go through the game, you have these real-life GT World Series drivers as your opponents, and they'll often have things to say in the various events. Most of the time it's pretty standard and forgettable, bar the odd meme-worthy line. Seriously, this one has some real shorts are comfy and easy to wear energy. The point is, you can pretty much ignore them entirely and not much would change, other than the final cutscene making even less sense. The reason I bring them up though is because GT7 can't seem to keep their narrative consistent. In one place, they're these pro drivers the game wants you to look up to and learn from, and in another, they're fellow aspiring racers trying to make a name for themselves in the world of GT. They can't commit to either story, so they just do both. Let me know if anyone else noticed this as well. Ah, the menu books. They railroad you through a mediocre time and then conclude way too early. Does that sound familiar to you? It really is a masterclass in how not to do something. If you want to express how fascinating and rich the world of cars is, why don't you show us? Show don't tell. It's one of the cardinal rules when trying to express something through media, but GT7 fails at this spectacularly. I know what you're thinking. I haven't complained about the menu books enough. Well, I've actually found a new angle to look at it. Some of you might know that I'm playing through Gran Turismo 3 currently, my beloved, and one thing that I really appreciate about it, and the other previous GT games, is how fluid it feels. If you want to, you can just go from one race to the next, to the next, to the next continuously with no interruptions, just that constant gameplay loop. Whereas in GT7, because of the menu books, that momentum is just brought to a screeching halt every time you go to the cafe. In some of the early menu books, you might spend more time navigating out of a race, over to the cafe, collecting your reward, watching the cinematic and being lectured, and then starting the next menu book than you actually spend in the race itself. How did they approve this? It's so aggressively terrible and nobody questioned it. If you ask me, you can almost directly trace the quality of a Gran Turismo game against the richness and importance of the single player experience in said game. The main reason for this is that I believe a good single player adds meaning to other features in the game. Since probably GT5, the single player aspect in these games has gradually gotten less important over time, with more focus shifted onto things like photo mode, customization, showcasing and learning about cars, and of course, online racing. 
With the exception of the online stuff, each of these aspects can gain a stronger importance if the core single player experience is itself stronger. Most players will have a much bigger urge to check out scapes or design a livery for a car that actually feels like it's theirs based on the experience they've had with it in the main GT mode. If you're just getting cars thrown at you constantly, there's no reason to develop any sort of attachment towards it, especially when it will be made redundant after a few races. Even more so if it's a really expensive car that you've bought and then find out there's hardly anything to do with it. Why would you care? At that point, it might be more out of obligation, since the game clearly doesn't intend for you to race them, so you might as well do something with it. The issue is that rather than these features feeling like an addition to the single player, they instead dilute it, because it appears that Polyphony believes they can get away with putting in far less effort because there are so many other things to do. This idea is further reinforced with how the game was marketed. Find your line was the tagline, essentially meaning find the aspect of GT7 that really appeals to you, or even find something you already love within GT7. For example, if you already love photography, here escapes, that sort of thing. The true irony though is that for people who loved the classic GT games with their lengthy and rewarding campaigns, well, you're shit out of luck. Guys, we can't find our line if you don't actually put it in the game. It's clear that GT7 is not a game that'll appeal to the hardcore GT fans, much in the same way GT Sport didn't. But how this gets messy is that's not how they advertised it. In the announcement trailer, the first time we ever saw the game, they threw it up in bold letters, Gran Turismo is back. Let's be clear, Gran Turismo hadn't gone anywhere. In June of 2020, GT Sport was still receiving semi-regular updates. So the message was clear, Gran Turismo as we knew it was back. That alone is pretty funny, or pretty depressing depending on your perspective, considering what they did with GT7. But it gets worse. Much, much worse. Gran Turismo 7 will represent the pinnacle of the GT journey. We think of it as our most complete GT to date. Our aim was to create a driving simulator that all players can enjoy. Whether you're a hardcore Gran Turismo fan, or brand new to the series, I think Gran Turismo 7 will be enjoyable for everyone. This is ultimately the classic GT campaign mode, but GT7 has more to offer. Honestly, watching these trailers again, knowing what we know now, it's quite surreal. Whether they're straight up lying to our face, or trying to skirt around the more controversial items in the game, like the roulette tickets, and associated engine swaps, brand invitations, etc. One of my favourite things is in the State of Play, where they show the custom race feature being used to make a multi-class race with LMP1 and GTE cars. If you've actually tried this in GT7, you'll know why this is so funny, because if you choose to be in the faster cars, so LMP1 in this case, your opponents are incredibly bad at overtaking the slower cars, sometimes getting stuck behind them for minutes. And if you choose to be in the slower class, you'll encounter the speed manipulation issue which I covered before, meaning that your supposed opponents will crawl around the track, and you might even catch up with the faster cars, but more likely you'll just end up between the two in the middle of nowhere. The fact that they hardly mention the main single player experience outside of the menu books should have been a bad sign. Now, I'm not coming in here as Mr. Hindsight saying that we should have known what would happen from just these trailers, because I really didn't expect them to mess it up so badly either. The main point is that they had had all the pieces to make GT7 incredible, they just needed to put it all together. Even the menu books, despite how much I despise them, could have fit into this. All they needed to do was take the classic, classic GT, GT campaign, campaign mode. mode and add the menu books to it, not restructure the campaign entirely so the menu books are the only way to progress. What I imagine is the campaign from say GT4, with all the same events unlocking in the same way, but with the menu books on the side as an optional activity. If you were a new player to the series, you might be enticed to follow the menu books as they would give guidance and help you through the game, but if you were more experienced you could just ignore it and do what you want, earning cars in a more natural way. Even still, you might want to check in and claim some rewards for cars you've earned, but the distinction is that you would have gotten those cars anyway, rather than being forced to do it then and there to progress. 
Also, a better system would be to give you the option of multiple menus to choose from at a given stage, or doing multiple menus at the same time, to keep things from getting stale. The thing is that from these trailers, the obvious conclusion would be what I just described. A blend of new and old, appealing to both sides of the spectrum and anywhere in between. It really is that simple. So why they butcher the formula to make the menu books the one and only priority is just an unnecessary limitation. But the truly bizarre thing is that in interviews with Kazunori, he talks about GT7 as if this is what they did, a true mixture of new and old that appeals to everyone. If you play GT7, and of course the older titles that it supposedly pulls from, you know that this is far from the truth, so how can he be so barefaced in saying this? Is it deception or simply delusion? Well, to me, I feel that when he says this, he personally believes he is telling the truth. But he designed those older games, how could he not understand the core appeal? Well, my theory has been that he never actually went back and played them since he finished their development, and has just been making assumptions. And for a while, that did just stay as a theory, since there was no way of confirming it. Until recently, when I came across an interview around the launch of GT7 that shed some light on the situation. When asked about the older games inspiring GT7, he states, Our developers know all the Gran Turismo games and have played them. I prefer to look to the future myself. So whilst it doesn't outright confirm it, that does imply that he didn't go back to play and fully understand them himself. I understand that Kaz is very forward thinking, but if you're making a game that pulls inspiration from its predecessors, do you not think it would be wise to go back and check this for yourself? Some might say it would be negligent not to. If this really is true, it would explain a lot of why GT7 ended up the way that it did. I would liken it to Chinese Whispers, where other people on the dev team may tell Kaz about certain aspects of those older games, and he of course will have memories of them as well, but since he doesn't fully understand them anymore, he can't translate it correctly to GT7. This is why it seems to hit all of the same beats, like winning races to earn cars, doing championships, license tests, missions, having all of that, but doesn't put it all together in a way that is cohesive, or seems to understand the core ideas. And that then becomes very obvious when you actually play it. This of course is not specific to just me. Whilst I'd love to sit here and take credit for everything in these critiques as my own original ideas, I'm clearly not the only person who feels this way. Anyone who played and loved those older games will understand. I did play Gran Turismo 7, and honestly, as someone who's a long-term fan of Gran Turismo 7, playing through the single-player experience, I honestly felt insulted. I don't mean this as in like the game said something about me or disrespected my family or anything like that. I mean insulted as a fan of the series, as someone who sat through delay after delay after delay of every single Gran Turismo game like ever being pushed back years. That I was playing a game that was so blissfully unaware and just didn't care. I honestly got to the point where I couldn't tell if Gran Turismo 7 was making fun of Gran Turismo, like it was a parody of itself, which is a really weird thing to have happen with a video game, to say the least, especially one that clearly tries as hard as Gran Turismo clearly does. Half of Gran Turismo's appeal really is just navigating well-crafted menus, listening to relaxing music while steadily progressing from used Dodge Neons to Pike's Peak Monsters. Except that doesn't exist in Gran Turismo 7, because GT Life has been replaced by these infamous cafe books that's effectively just a battle pass. Drip feeding you minuscule rewards and wheel spins that manage to be even more insulting than what came before. There's no sugarcoating this. The menu book concept is a complete utter failure in game design. Polyphony have managed to make a 22 hour tutorial, almost completely stripping away player agency and expression. It's a tutorial that concludes not by releasing the player into the game's sandbox, nearly uninhibited and free to explore, but by rolling the credits and dumping them back into the game, feeling as if the decisions were made for them before they even purchased it. You can't just half ass it and then pretend it's anything like those older games. People will notice, and they won't be happy. The best analogy I can give for GT7 is that it tries to wear a pastiche of the older GT games like a Halloween costume, with no deeper understanding of what they actually stood for and offered. I mean, if their idea of calling back to the history of GT is slapping Sunday Cup on a completely unrelated event, or choosing between three starter cars when you're forced to get the other two within the next five minutes, then you've got to wonder why they even bothered. It's almost like they're making fun of you for liking those previous games. 
given what happened to Grand Valley as well, we're at a point where there are people actively wishing we don't get back any more original Gran Turismo tracks for fear of what Polyphony is going to do to them. Sure, that is an exaggerated way of thinking, but I kind of get it. Polyphony doesn't understand why people like Gran Turismo. So by pretending it gets us, by doing things like this and failing miserably, it just becomes insulting. On my second playthrough to record footage, when it asked me if I'd ever travelled the world of Gran Turismo before, I said no. Partly because I was interested what it had to say, and partly because if I chose yes, I was concerned that Polyphony would send someone to my house to personally spit in my face. Throughout the series, you will have noticed that I've mainly used Gran Turismo 3 as a point of comparison against GT7. As I've said, GT3 was my first Gran Turismo and my personal favourite, but there is one specific reason why I use it to compare. You see, if I use GT4 to frame all of my issues with GT7, some could say, that's not fair, GT4 has way more cars and tracks, of course it's going to be a much more complete game. You can't make that argument when looking at GT7 against GT3. There is absolutely no excuse for why GT7 should not be as big of a game and as much of an experience as GT3, if not even more so given the inclusion of so many new features since then. This is one of the many reasons why I absolutely adore GT3, it uses its limited content to the fullest. Not a single car or track goes to waste because it simply can't, given how little content there is, at least by modern standards. Does it go over the top on occasion? Sure, I mean 10 laps of the test course in a Toyota Yaris was not a good idea by any means, but this is still far preferable than GT7 which goes in the complete opposite direction. It's no surprise that challenge runs of these older games have blown up in recent years because they have so much depth and there are so many different ways to play them. In GT7, challenges like these simply won't work. Aside from the try not to fall asleep and or die of boredom challenge, to be fair though that one is quite hard. The sheer amount of content that goes unused or hardly used in the main single player is staggering. I personally feel really bad for those developers who pour their heart and soul for the better part of a year crafting an immaculate 3D model and then the car gets functionally kneecapped by ending up insanely overpriced and having next to no utility so 99.9% .9 of players would have literally no reason to want it or try to get it. It's just embarrassing. Maybe having SUVs in GT7 isn't such a bad idea after all, because much like SUVs, GT7 is an ode to wasteful excess, having something for the sake of just having it with no deeper meaning or actual functionality, inefficiency at its most egregious, standing in direct contrast to the games that came before it. It's safe to say that things have changed a fair amount since I first started work on the series around the beginning of December 2022. Not changed within GT7, no, that stayed pretty much the same, but a couple of minor things that have been altered since I mentioned them. What I really mean is the discussion around racing games in general has shifted drastically in that time. 2023, it seems, is the year of we expect more from racing games, and I'm really glad to see this. I myself am of course part of this as well, but there have been plenty of other creators giving their own thoughts on this topic, and I hope more continue to do so. That video by Racevic I showed before is an excellent deep dive into the state of the genre, from true arcade racers all the way to hardcore sims and everything in between. It should really serve as a wake up call how behind the times these games really are, not only to the developers and publishers, but the players as well. And that's a key point, we as players should expect more from these games. No, it's not enough that a racing game looks beautiful and drives well. Do you know why? Because it's a game, not a tech demo. It has to work functionally as well as technically. It would be like playing an adventure game and saying, it's so fun to run around and kill enemies and look at the scenery, but not paying any attention to the other key elements like the story, the items, the side activities, the characters, all of these factors which go into making the game a game. Of course, that's not a perfect comparison as the driving in a driving game does have a larger importance relative to comparisons in other genres, but you can see my point. Unfortunately, those who are paid to review these games often don't. This should go without saying, but don't take mainstream game journalists too seriously. It is a meme at this point, but I find it's even more true with racing game reviews. How can it be that these highly anticipated games come out, whether it's GT7 or Forza Horizon 5 or whatever, they have these glowing reviews as they're seen as near perfect masterpieces, but then a month or two down the line, nobody is really talking about them. The only people who still are, are those dedicated enough to stick with it, documenting the numerous issues, how the game is flawed, lacking, not enough of an evolution from the previous games, and in some ways, clearly worse. 
how does this keep happening? To me, it seems as though if a game is anticipated to be amazing, it will be reviewed as such, regardless of the actual quality. Again, nothing new in games journalism, but what can we as players really do? Don't pre-order games for one. GT7 is the only game I pre-ordered since Gran Turismo 5, and I still regret it. Try to avoid the hype. This should be a cautionary tale by now, but given how many times it's happened when looking at video games as a whole, I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Still, at least try and wait for a game to actually deliver on what it promises, because the discrepancy can be quite big. And finally, don't listen to games journalists. Not only because they don't often understand what makes a racing game truly good, but because they only get a short amount of time to play a game before reviewing it, and game designers know this. This would explain why GT7 seemed a lot bigger than it actually was, since nobody was expecting it to just end almost as soon as you get into the racing cars. As someone who's been through what most long-term fans would consider to be the decline of Gran Turismo since GT5, I've pretty much seen everything. To summarise briefly, GT5 was massively overhyped due to the numerous delays and wild promises, and had no chance of living up to its expectations. Even still, there were some odd and confusing design choices, like the level system, the GT mode being noticeably smaller, and of course, PS2 era car models. To be fair, the issues for developers working with the PS3 have been well documented, so some of this is understandable and I know that GT5 was the first GT game for many people and is still fondly remembered. Despite everything, it was still Gran Turismo and understood what that stands for, as well as introducing a few new interesting ideas and full online play. GT6 were just more of the same. It wasn't that ambitious, and almost every issue you could find with GT5 was carried over to GT6, as well as the main GT mode being shrunk even more. Even still, it did have that magic, with a real sandbox vibe, sort of like GT2, given the ridiculous selection of cars and ease of obtaining them. Again, it did have a few good ideas in there, and I believe as time goes on, people will appreciate GT6 even more for being a type of game that basically cannot exist today due to the sheer amount of content. It's what many people considered to be the last true Gran Turismo game that followed the established formula. GT Sport came along in 2017, and then took the formula and threw it out of the window. It was always very clear what GT Sport was, not really a sequel to the previous six titles, but its own thing entirely. They could have called it GT7, internally it was even known as GT7 SP, but doing that would have been foolish and misleading to long-time fans, so they were right not to. Sport had a much larger focus on online racing, and with that came a bigger emphasis on more realistic circuits and contemporary racing cars. The classic GT mode wasn't even included, in a technical sense though, it was a complete revolution over GT6, and as time went on, Polyphony would continuously update the game, adding much requested cars and tracks, and even an homage to the classic GT modes of the past. You can hear from just those descriptions what that era was like. It never felt as though Gran Turismo was living up to its true potential, and couldn't really commit fully to a clear direction, but at the same time, still making games that felt connected to the past. Except for Sport, which was something completely different that divided the fanbase, but was at least new and interesting, and was clear in what it was trying to achieve. GT7 seemed to offer a unified vision of what Gran Turismo should be. On paper, it seemed perfect. There was no way they could mess it up, because they had so much in their favour. They already designed a brilliant baseline to work from with sports, they had all of the classic GT games to draw inspiration from and build upon, they had a fan base which was craving a game of this type after being starved for so long, and what you might forget is that they had no competition, and still don't until the Forza Motorsport reboot comes out later this year. There is no reason why GT7 couldn't have been at least equally good as some of those older GTs. If all they did was copy GT3 or GT4 for the current day, that would have already been better than what they actually made not even mentioning the ways in which they could easily improve upon those games. Obviously just copying them to make GT7 wasn't going to happen, but my point is that even putting in less effort, they could have produced a better product. At this point, it's no exaggeration to say, understanding how and why GT7 turned out as it did has become an obsession for me. That's kind of why I made this series in the first place, so I could get these thoughts out of my head and move on with my life. We've now covered the how in excruciating detail, but what about the why? Why did GT7 end up as it did, and what was the motivation? Through making this series, I've heard every possible explanation from people, whether that be in my comments or just anywhere else. GT7 was clearly rushed, and that's why the single player is so lacking. Well, it's been well over a year, and hardly anything I've talked about has been improved outside of the first few weeks after launch. So no, that's clearly not true. GT7 wasn't given enough development budget. As a first-party PlayStation exclusive, I find that very hard to believe, and just looking at the game 
makes that even harder. Not only that, but when you consider the extremely lavish and highly produced GT Championship live events, events in which not even the competitors are getting paid, that argument completely falls apart. If there is any truth to it whatsoever, there would be more a case of Polyphony not using that budget correctly and not prioritising what's most important. They did make the music rally after all, which I've used as a punchline a couple of times because that's all it really is. I can imagine something like it in say GT4, where it'd be viewed as a novelty and a small distraction courtesy of quirky old Polyphony, and initially that's how most people saw it. But when you look at it again in the context of how underbaked GT7 is in so many areas, it really makes you wonder why they spent any time and money on it whatsoever. I've also seen people try to justify why they chose to design the game as they did. It's supposed to appeal to younger players who want instant gratification and access to the fast cars very easily. No, it's aimed towards more mature players who work a regular 9 to 5 and don't have time to slog through long championships and endurance races. This is again despite the older games like GT3 having a complete arcade mode, which granted instant access to a lot of the faster cars and even had its own form of progression. Honestly, all of these seem like excuses to me, and I don't really believe anyone actually has a clue why it truly is the way that it is. I don't fully, to be honest, but through my research, I feel like I've gotten as good a grasp on it as anybody, at least anybody who doesn't work at Polyphony. To understand GT7, we have to understand the man behind it, Kazunori Yamauchi, the tree kicker himself. That is far easier said than done, especially for someone who lives on the other side of the planet and who's never spoken to him, and at this rate probably never will. So whilst we can't understand him truly on a personal level, we can understand him on a professional level from his various interviews and appearances. Of course, Kaz isn't necessarily liable for every design decision, but he does oversee the whole operation and gives the ultimate approval, so he has to take this responsibility. One of the best places to gain a deeper insight on him is the 84 minute documentary about him from 2014. Although it is almost a decade old at this point, it still represents a lot of the same core ideas which we can observe in much more recent interviews and is well worth a watch. His strive for realism above all else, I mean it's in the title, pushing the virtual divide, is clear to see and very obvious if you've seen his games and know the story of Gran Turismo. There's one part that I found quite interesting, where he talked about how as a child his parents would put up sheets of paper on the walls for him to draw all over, and once he filled up the pages they would be taken down and new clean paper put up to replace them. I'm not a psychologist so take what I'm about to say with that in mind, but it is quite fascinating how these small things when we're younger can have a massive impact on how we are as people when we get older and our general mindset. Understanding this then, it's not so surprising that Kaz ended up as the creative individual that he is, and that seems to be the message that the documentary is putting forward. But a very interesting parallel that I couldn't ignore was how this idea relates to Gran Turismo, pulling it down and then starting from fresh sound familiar? Also, how Kaz describes his parents taking down the pictures and replacing them. There's no attachment to him, merely, that's done, now on to the next. It's this idea of not putting your previous work on a pedestal, and the description pretty much says this as well, and again is another mirror to Gran Turismo. Sentimentality is very powerful, but it has to be used correctly. It's not healthy to simply revel in nostalgia, trying to escape the present and the future, but at the same time, if you don't learn from the past, you're doomed to make the same mistakes, so you have to keep it in mind. There's another part further in, in which Kaz muses about car designers pulling from the past for their new designs. I'm going to play this part in full, and as I do, please think about this in the context of Gran Turismo, with the cars being the games, and the car makers being Kaz and Polyphony. あの、なんだっていいっていう状態からデザインっていうのはできないので、で、あの、過去にこういう名車があった、ああいう名車があった、こういう歴史があったっていうことをこう参照しながらそれに例えばま、5%、10%のオリジナリティを加えて新しいもの
very easy to lose sight of what's directly in front of you. With Gran Turismo, Kaz seems so preoccupied with looking forward to what Gran Turismo can be in the future, and what new possibilities can be discovered, that he's lost sight of why most people even played the games in the first place. Despite this, Kaz has always tried to emphasise the importance of the realism and the technology behind it, but this was never the main draw for a lot of us, particularly those of us who started with GT1, 2 or 3. It for sure plays a role, and always has, but this documentary really highlights his obsession for these things. If we refer back to the same interview where he talked about SUVs in GT7, he was also asked about the possibility of Tourist Trophy 2. For those who don't know, Tourist Trophy was essentially Gran Turismo on bikes, and was actually built on the game engine of GT4. The game was very well received, but sadly is yet to achieve a sequel. His response was essentially, we very easily could, but we don't have a control method for bikes that conveys the same feeling as a steering wheel for a car, so until something like that can be developed, we won't. You know, there's a very famous quote by Reggie fils former COO of Nintendo of America. You might have heard it before. If it's not fun, why bother? With Kaz, his mantra seems to be, if it's not realistic, why bother? That is effectively what he's saying here. If that's what he believes, then fine. But what does that say about games with motorbikes as a whole? Should nobody even bother since True Immersion is so far away? Was the original Tourist Trophy a mistake? No, of course not. Games are fun. If people want to race bikes in a video game, then those games deserve to exist. Complete realism be damned. It's times like these that I'm truly glad not every game designer is like Kaz. What would the state of video games even look like at this point? Listen, if they actually want to make Tourist Trophy 2 and this is the only obstacle, they should just make it. Loads of people are still holding out hope for it, and I'm sure after 17 years since the first game, they should have plenty of interesting ideas for it. Or they might not, but that didn't stop them from making GT7. From watching the documentary, one thing that's clear is how Gran Turismo is a reflection of Kaz's own interests. From sport mode, which mirrors real-life professional motorsport as Kaz has taken part in, to Scapes, which is an embodiment of his passion for photography and appreciating Kaz as art. The only conclusion I have is that Kaz doesn't have any interest in those long structured campaigns of the old games, or at least he doesn't anymore. As much as games these days are often designed by committee, it really seems like GT7 has the opposite problem. It's designed purely to his own vision of what it should be, and there's no one who can step in and say, okay, but what about these key features that people loved those older games for? How can we just leave those out, or more often the case with GT7, warp them into something else entirely? All of this has led me to believe that the only reason the older GT games were structured the way they were was because they had to be. In a lot of interviews, you often hear Kaz saying things like, oh, we were limited by this or that in the older games because we didn't have the technology to make what we really wanted, but now we do. When you don't have online play, serious customization, a fully fledged livery editor or photo modes, there are no distractions from the main GT mode. It has to be fully fleshed out with an engaging structure and progression, and sometimes hundreds of hours of content, because that's all there was. They were made out of necessity. I hope that this isn't entirely the case, because that would be quite sad, but given the diminishing importance of the main single player mode from GT5 onwards, the trend is clear. What's also clear is how Kaz views Gran Turismo as not just a game, but a platform for automotive culture. He really wants it to have some sort of higher importance beyond just a game where you have fun driving cars. To a lot of people, driving is a chore akin to brushing your teeth, but with the caveat that if you make a mistake, you could die. Racing games clearly won't appeal much to these types of people, but Kaz seems to have a real motivation to change the discussion around cars, and Gran Turismo is his tool to do that. Being honest, it is quite a noble goal. So on paper, that's not a bad thing, but how we can go about doing that, maybe. If we go back to that interview where he talks about SUVs, which I'm sorry to bring up again, but it just highlights so many of my points, he seems to have this real urge to represent the changing landscape of car culture by talking about adding cars like these, but he doesn't seem to consider if people would actually want them, would use them, or how they fit into a game like Gran Turismo at all. If GT7 can have racing cars specifically designed for racing on circuits that have basically no purpose within the game at present, then what hope do SUVs have? It's just more pointless bloat that nobody is asking for when you could spend the time adding cars and features that people actually want. But no, we can't have cars like the Toyota Chaser because that's not connected to the future. Kaz, in drifting circles, cars like the Chaser and Mark II are basically god, and they'll probably continue to be for a while to come. You can't say they're not connected, they're not with 
the times when they categorically still are. The fact that they've lasted so long in car culture should tell you all you need to know, and the fact that people are still asking for cars like these should be an even bigger hint that they are still culturally relevant. The fact that pretty much all of the 90s JDM legends have ballooned massively in value over the past few years, something that you've directly recognised and reflected in GT7, means there's no way that you're not aware of this. Ultimately, this isn't even really about the cars, since if they add one or two SUVs, or don't add the chaser, it's not a big deal, but more his philosophy that really pisses me off. It's the closest thing that I've seen to him giving a middle finger directly towards the fanbase. You can't just decide what's relevant to everyone within the automotive space based on your preconceived bias that everything new is better and everything old is outdated and serves no functional purpose. Ask people whether they want to see a Toyota Chaser or a BMW X8 in their racing game because you're not going to get the answer you want to hear, not as if that actually matters to you. To try and shape your game around these ideals is incredibly short-sighted. People know what they want from a game like Gran Turismo, and in most cases, it isn't SUVs. But not only can we see shifting priorities within the game, but also Gran Turismo as a whole. Gran Turismo is a brand, no longer just a game, and over the coming years, I believe the brand of Gran Turismo will grow even further, with the games just being one side of it. Gran Turismo has its fingers in so many pies that it's honestly quite hard to keep track of. They of course have the movie coming out later this year, the GT Championships, technical partnerships with Michelin and Brembo, partnerships with Toyota, Mazda, Genesis, BBS, IMSA, Super Formula, Sony AI with GT Sophie, and a bunch more car makers through Vision GT. Of course, a lot of those make sense for a racing game, but a few are questionable. I have no issues with them making a movie, it may even be good, but it's more what that represents that has me concerned. Kaz has said that a big desire to have a Gran Turismo movie is to make more people aware of Gran Turismo as a franchise. Fair enough, but if this becomes a normal part of Gran Turismo, I have concerns that it's going to further reduce the importance of the games, in the same way that adding more features to the games have reduced the importance of the main single player aspect. But that remains to be seen. Anyway, Vision GT is probably the one that I have the most feelings about. I'm planning to make a deep dive into Vision GT as a whole, given 2023 is its 10 year anniversary, but for now I'll just say this. Vision GT is not for us players. It's for Gran Turismo to build and strengthen its relations in the automotive industry and have even more influence which Kaz clearly desires. The content it produces for the game and the impact it has on us as players is almost irrelevant. Most Vision GT cars serve no purpose in GT7, and neither did they in GT Sport. The brief is to design the ultimate sports car for Gran Turismo, so what the hell is the point of a 1200 horsepower rocket ship that's way faster than any other road car and also has an off-road version? In what universe will this ever fit into GT7? Even with something like GT Sophie, which undoubtedly has the power to make the game better, I still have that feeling of cynical intentions in the back of my mind. The idea that they're again not making this specifically for the players or to make the game better, but rather just to flex their tech with Sony and again build relations in that industry. I'm yet to be convinced that they have a way to make it work in the game long term, but I'd love to be proven wrong. You know, a comment I sometimes get is people saying that Polyphony and Kaz should watch my videos or even hire me. This is probably the best compliment I could ever receive, so thank you very much for all of these. Creating or at least helping to create a racing game is a dream of mine, but it's unlikely that'll ever happen. But somehow, what I find even more unlikely is the developers watching and responding to my videos. We're talking about a game and a creator that won't even fix the simplest of issues that could be solved in minutes, even when people are contacting him directly to tell him. Sure, you can't listen to every rando off the street, but in this case it's just so obvious, people shouldn't even need to tell him. Polyphony has been notorious for their lack of communication and not responding to feedback, and that's never been great, but with GT7 it feels like we've reached a tipping point. If the interview from earlier didn't make this clear already, they don't care what you think. Kaz doesn't care, Polyphony doesn't care, Sony certainly doesn't care as long as it gets sales, and frankly, unless there's mass outrage in the vein of last year, just after launch, they have no reason to care. They will only take action if people are burning down their houses. Metaphorically speaking, don't actually do that. Ultimately, if the game were incredible and widely loved by all, then you could argue that communication doesn't really matter, and they would be right to not listen to anyone else. Leave them alone because they know what to do. But GT7 is not that game. It is fundamentally flawed in ways that stand in direct opposition to the games that came beforehand, and makes you question if Polyphony even understands why people like these types of games. 
but they just continue onwards doing the same thing, blissfully unaware of anything anyone has to say, with the game not being majorly changed since April 2022. It's sheer arrogance. And when you then consider the multitude of minor issues that are obvious to anyone and can be fixed near instantly if they actually cared, it becomes clear that it makes them look not only incredibly stubborn, but extremely inept. It's my belief that the people working within Polyphony are actively discouraged to look at feedback and instead told to just focus on their work. This seems like the obvious conclusion given their action, or should I say lack of action, in the face of what I and many other people, including other content creators, have said. And I kind of hope this is the case, because if it's not, there's only one other possible explanation for this. And no matter how much I dislike the decisions made for GT7, I simply don't want that to be true. Many people absolutely love Gran Turismo 7, and I appreciate that. People play these games for many different reasons, and I'm not trying to take that away from anyone. It's simply that what I personally play these games for, and consider to be the most important aspect of them, is seriously lacking in GT7. So much so that when I think about what GT7 does well, it almost makes me angrier when I consider what it could have been, and what a colossal missed opportunity it was. A comment I also sometimes get is along the lines of, I see where you're coming from, and I agree with what you're saying, but I still love GT7. That's fair enough, but I really do like these comments because it tells me that even within people who adore the game and may have their own biases coming into my videos, they can still appreciate what I'm saying. It's still getting to them on some level. And to me, that's probably the biggest effect I can have with this series. What I and so many others really value about Gran Turismo is clearly not being valued anywhere near as much by Polyphony. And nowhere is this more obvious than with the updates they're bringing to the game. As of writing, the most recent update was in March, update 1.31. Let's dissect it and you'll begin to understand what I mean. Not considering minor tweaks like to the handling model and performance point system, there are three major things I want to talk about. The first are the cars. Five of them in fact, and a great selection. I have no issues with the cars introduced, the Porsche 904 GTS being my personal favourite that really scratches that itch for me, but of course this will be different for everybody. The second are the new tracks, the words new and tracks being in air quotes. Two versions of the Nürburgring incorporating a cut through on the GP course to make a shorter variant. This version was in GT5 and GT6, and despite the Nürburgring being carried over in its entirety to GT Sport, this layout was left on the chopping block. Five and a half years after the release of GT Sport, now they finally bring it back to the series. Why the delay? Who the hell knows? And at this point, who knows why Polyphony does anything anymore? It was the same thing with the rotating camera, which was only present in the closed beta for GT Sport in early 2017, and then didn't come back until well over five years later in an update for GT7. They just take stuff out with no explanation, and then add it back in with no explanation. Maybe they have their reasons, but we'll never know because they don't care enough to actually tell us. But the thing that really speaks the most to their mindset and lack of action when it comes to some very obvious complaints is the third and final thing. The races they added in this update. Four of them. Four races. That was it. In this update, they added more cars than they did races. Even without the context that GT7 is still severely lacking in races and events, it should be obvious why it doesn't make any sense to do this. And not only that, but none of these races are new events, just more races for event types we already have. At this point, I feel like I've already shown just how needed more races and events are in GT7 that serve a wider range of cars and actually give them purpose. The last time a completely new event was added to GT7, it was update 1.25 back in October. Seriously, it's that bad. And aside from the races at the returning Nürburgring layouts, they continue to overuse certain variants whilst ignoring other ones that still barely have any races, or in some cases, don't even have any races at all. Take a look at Tokyo Expressway. Before before the update, the East Clockwise layout already had three races, whereas East Anti-Clockwise had no races. So what did they do? Add a fourth f***ing race to East Clockwise. It's a similar case with the Porsche Cup race at Kyoto, which again reuses a layout with plenty of races already, whilst a few others still have none. One of the cars added was the 2019 Audi RS5 DTM, which is the first new car to be added to Group 2 since the game released. Considering that, what do you think would be an obvious event to add that has been missing since day one? As f***ing if. It's like they're trying to do a bad job on purpose. Also, the extra menu featuring the GT500 Group 2 cars doesn't even talk about the actual cars, but instead racing cars in general, which is really odd. 
Do they have some sort of agenda against these cars and so won't make events for them? Well actually, it's been proven that's not the case. You see, thanks to Nenkai over on Twitter, we're able to see a few events which are hidden within the code of GT7. These events are for the Red Bull X2019, a classic car event, an All Japan GT car event, and even a full championship for historic racing cars. Whether these were cut from the game, or they're waiting to be added is still unknown, but they were discovered back in November, and they're still not in the game. And as Nenkai shows, they seem to be almost completely finished, so there's no reason why they couldn't be added tomorrow. It wouldn't solve the issue, but would certainly be a good start in giving many more cars actual purpose through races to use them in. It's no joke to say that I believe this is one of the biggest, if not the single biggest issue with GT7 at present, and Polyphony are seemingly completely unaware of this. There is no possible way that they could have released GT7 in the state it was, ending after a single championship for Group 3 cars and not having any events for anything beyond that, and not known that people would be pissed off. Of course I was when I finished the game, but I always thought, okay, whatever, they're gonna slowly drip feed the rest of the game to us over time. A scummy tactic, but eventually it'll be more complete. But outside a couple of races for Group 1 cars, they just haven't. At this point, what the f*** are they waiting for? World War 3? A nuclear apocalypse? The inevitable heat death of the universe? I don't get it. And furthermore, the races they do add are just the same sh** where you start miles behind the opponents and they crawl around the track as rolling roadblocks until you pass them and finish the race. No nuance, no intrigue, no tension, no excitement. But I've got a pro GT driver telling me how luxurious the Toyota Alphard is. F***ing wonderful. In isolation, this doesn't matter, but given everything else, it just shows how far their priorities are skewed with GT7. And yet you still have people praising them. It's like some people's standards in regards to gameplay are so low that they almost don't expect anything when it comes to actual races. In the racing game. Sure, the cars are good, a great selection of very well made, and all as a free update, but if the ecosystem that they exist in barely exists itself, then there's hardly any point for them to exist either. Even I felt myself getting a little excited when I saw the silhouette teaser, but quickly snapped out of it when I remembered the state of the game they're being added to. I've driven that 904 maybe twice, and despite it handling great and being fun to drive, I have no desire to go back and race it, because the game gives me no reason to. It says a lot that from my 500 plus hours of playing this game, 300 of that was spent not even driving. Making more events is most likely the easiest, cheapest, and least time consuming part of making GT7. Far easier than modeling the cars and tracks, or building an authentic physics simulation. So why they give us even less than the bare minimum when it comes to them is unacceptable, and there is no excuse that can be made to justify this. Oh, and also don't be that guy who says just use Custom Race, because that isn't an excuse either. Not just because Custom Race is flawed and broken in so many ways, to the point that trying to make a decent race is like trying to pull out your own teeth with a pair of scissors, but also because it's not an excuse for Polyphony to not give us a full game by just giving us the tools and telling us to design it ourselves, despite my best efforts to do just that. This is why I may seem dismissive to things like VR, ray tracing, super detailed physics simulations and other technical stuff which is undoubtedly good, because ultimately if the game isn't good, I'm not going to play it just for those things. It still needs to stand on its own as a compelling game to play through. It's sad to believe, but there are people who think that by adding VR, all of my complaints are somehow negated, when in reality it only strengthens my point of view. And that's not even mentioning other aspects of this AAA first party PlayStation exclusive where they clearly didn't try at all and just kind of hoped nobody would realise. I mean, remember when they tried to have a proper damage model in Gran Turismo 5? After that they pretty much gave up entirely and now slamming into a wall at 250 miles an hour results in a cracked headlight. Now that's what I call realism. Because of external pressure from car makers, a full damage model with proper deformation is realistically never going to happen again in Gran Turismo. And Kaz knows this, which is why he seems so uncomfortable whenever the topic gets brought up, and you get the feeling he wishes people would stop asking him about it. Even still, that's no excuse for why the mechanical damage is so simplified and again has barely been improved since GT5. People have mentioned that I of course only talk about the negatives of GT7 and hardly ever the positives. The main reason for that is this is a critique, not an impartial review. So I only mention the positives when I can use it to frame the issues. Another reason is that if you want to see people talking about the good parts of GT7, you can basically go anywhere for that. 
I would just be repeating what so many others have already talked about, and that's not my style, and contradicts why I decided to make videos in the first place. Not to mention the amount of Gran Turismo bootlickers who seem so desperate to praise the game with every small inclusion, regardless if it actually makes the game any better, whilst the most obvious issues go completely unnoticed. I mean, GT7 is still winning awards. Look, I know 2022 was not a good year for racer games, so they're pretty much guaranteed to get these by virtue of just being a Gran Turismo game, regardless of the quality. They are truly meaningless. Despite this, I can't deny that what GT7 does well, the immersion, the simulation, etc, it does incredibly well. And at the same time, what it does bad, it does unbelievably bad. The crazy part is though, that what it gets right is typically the hardest part for developers. I don't think there are any other developers that do or can make racing games with a level of detail and precision that Polyphony does. And beyond that, GT7 does have some good ideas. Things like the mission events, which although not perfect, are designed primarily around having fun. Not just showing off its immersion and realism or forcing its sense of higher importance in how it needs to define car culture in your face. Car designers appearing in the cafe to share their thoughts about certain cars is a great touch, and how they just leave it for you to discover is even better. The insights they give often do make me think about cars in a different way, and more importantly, they feel real, because they are. Not like the menu books, which sounds so corporate that it seems like they're reading from a sales brochure. The small cutscenes for each championship is a great idea too, although it does feel like they didn't put as much effort in with the final few. But other than these few examples, GT7 is proof that yes, you can in fact polish a turd, and even trick some people into thinking it's a diamond. But when you look at it for what it really is, it's still a piece of shit. What you'll find is a common feeling from the community that they completely f***ed up the easy parts. I'm being 100% serious when I say that I could take a week to sit down and create a blueprint for a game using the same raw assets as GT7 and come up with something 10 times better. I think that most people who loved the older games and understood their appeal could do the same. I'm talking about the overall structure, individual races, events, leagues, opponents, prizes, unique and meaningful challenges, and a rewarding progression to tie it all together. These are the aspects that I believe the fanbase understands far better than Polyphony currently do. I'm surprised people haven't tried to make their own version of a Gran Turismo game yet to show Polyphony how it can be done. If anyone is, please get in touch because I'd love to be involved. What's very clear is that they don't hold the older GT games to the same reverence that the fans do. Where this gets ugly is despite them not really caring about these past games, they very clearly try to cash in on that nostalgia. We saw the obvious iconography in the trailers, we heard how Kaz relates GT7 to those older games in the interviews, and it's all just completely hollow since they didn't deliver on this and, more importantly, they don't even seem to understand it themselves. A great example in the game itself is with the roulettes. GT Sport had roulettes as well, but this is clearly trying to call back to GT3. Sure, that had its moments, but there was nothing like that feeling when you'd battled through a long, tough championship, and you come out the other side and end up with an incredible prize car that couldn't just be bought, and in some cases you might not have known was even in the game. You earned it. It was yours. GT7 takes that visual idea and then waters it down and morphs it into something completely cynical. Frustrating by design that objectively makes the game less fun for the sake of drawing out the experience in the hopes you'll keep coming back. It's pathetic. And so many things in this game do something similar for other aspects of the older games. They just don't understand, and more significantly, they don't want to. Also, why has nobody who's had the chance to interview Kaz called him out on things like this? Sure, I get that outlets don't want to cause trouble and end up blacklisted, but there are so many ways to approach the subject. Something as simple as, so, what was the idea behind the roulette tickets and putting unique rewards behind them, like engine swaps and tuning parts, rather than being able to buy them or win them from events? I, personally, would love to hear how he could possibly try and justify things like this. We were given a tease of the good times not only by the trailers, but even the intro to the damn game, showcasing races and events that simply don't exist in GT7, not unless you already own literally all of the cars and can then set up something similar as a custom race. You'll sometimes even see races like these in the Attract demo, so these race presets clearly exist within the code, but just aren't made into playable events. Gran Turismo as a series means a lot to me. There were times in my life where Gran Turismo was the only game I played. Since then, I've broadened my horizons, not only with other racing games, but other genres as well. Last year, I became really fascinated with game design. What goes into making a game fun and compelling to play? 
I've watched countless hours of videos on this topic, sometimes about games I've never even played, and just understanding some of the successes and mistakes of various games that can be seen based on what people expect of certain series and genres. Naturally, I applied this to Gran Turismo and racing games as a whole to understand why those older GT games meant so much to me. By doing that, I really solidified what I want from a racing game like Gran Turismo and how that contrasts with almost everything GT7 does wrong. If you play other types of games, it'll be easier to understand my complaints with GT7. In some cases, you might dislike something about it, but not fully recognise this until someone actually points it out. It is a balance though. There's no point in making an excellently crafted racing game that has tons of unique and interesting challenges and things to do with a fun progression that looks like complete sh** and handles like driving emotion type S. That is to say, also complete sh**. A game like that would serve as much purpose as GT7, which does the exact opposite. But through all of this, I have mentioned the other sides of the game. Things like sport mode, the livery editor, scapes, etc. It might be easy to say that I don't care about them at all and just want one specific thing from the game, but that couldn't be further from the truth. Throughout GT7 and GT Sport as well, I have taken hundreds of pictures both in races and in scapes, and then spent time editing and filtering each of them to my liking. I have spent hundreds of hours designing intricate original liveries and honing my design skills. I have dedicated months of my life to sport mode, practicing near endlessly until I reached a point where I was at my peak when I was racing and sometimes beating the best players in the world. I have done everything there is to do in Gran Turismo. And through all of that, I still come back to the main single player, because that is what made me love cars and love Gran Turismo above all else. The core single player is the heart of Gran Turismo, and everything else in the game should be built around it. But if GT7 messed it up so badly, why do I still play it? simple, I pretty much don't anymore. The only times I do is to record footage for these videos, do time trials every couple of weeks, and check out the 6 minutes worth of content that they add with every update. But despite that, GT7 still gives me what I want from a racing game better than anything else currently out there. That's because it's the only racing game of its type being made. If you want a game like GT7 that isn't GT7, you have to go back and play the older ones, and that's what I'm currently doing. And since they're so much better than GT7, I have very little reason to play it. If there were current alternatives, then I would certainly have jumped ship by now, but that gold rush of GT-style games from the early to mid-2000s has never seemed further away. How I wish we could go back to the days of the GT versus Forza tribalism. Sure, there are a few people who still think like this, but more than anything, most people just want these games to be good. They don't care whether it's GT or Forza, just make it fun. Will the FM reboot live up to this? I haven't been particularly inspired by what they've shown off so far, just more of the usual peacocking. Look at our visuals, look at our handling model, look at our sound design. That one's a bit more difficult. Given the presence of the now infamous Forza Wing, which they showed off so proudly, they seem to lack self-awareness much in the same way as Gran Turismo. We know almost nothing about the main single player beyond one line, so I don't want to judge it too early, because that's what happened with GT7, and we know how that went. So let's just wait and see what they can deliver. Anyway, GT7 clearly doesn't work as a true successor to the previous games, so it really has to be asked, what do Kaz and Polyphony really want to make? If we look at GT7, I think a game which functions as a virtual car museum is probably what they're aiming for, so why not lean into that more? The worst sin of GT7 is that they weren't upfront about what it really is, like they were with GT Sport. If they had been clear that they wanted the game to be this tutorialised tour through automotive history, where you also sometimes race, then fine. We could then judge the game based purely on those merits. Personally, I don't think it does a great job of teaching people about cars and getting them invested either, and there are certainly more compelling ways to do that. But at least there wouldn't be this sense of betrayal. From GT7, you almost get this feeling that it's saying this is what Gran Turismo is and always was, almost like they're gaslighting us, because it obviously isn't. The worst thing I can say about GT7 is that if you're looking for a more complete, classic Gran Turismo experience, even GT Sport is better. Yes, seriously. GT Sport, the game that was trying to be something completely different and had its GT mode tacked on the side in an update which still lacks many of the staples of Gran Turismo, like tuning parts, prize cars and championships. But what it does have is an incredible selection of events catering to almost every type of car in there, including many of the classic events we've lost with GT7. 
With the release of GT7, I was so ready to just forget GT Sport even existed, but I'm glad I went back to it because it's actually a lot better than I remembered, albeit not a patch on the first four games. And on top of that, you don't have to deal with nonsense like engine swap roulettes and brand invitations. If you want that McLaren F1, but saving up 20 million seems so out of reach, just go to Sport. It's only 1 million. Same deal with many other cars which are far more reasonably priced. Something that GT7 carries over from Sport is the always online aspect of the game, even for the single player, which completely bit them in the ass last year. The explanation has been to avoid people modifying save data that could impact Sport Mode ratings, which may have some truth, but I don't think is the full story. It just comes across as unnecessary, since many other online games don't need to do that, and it seems very anti-consumer, but more importantly means that when they inevitably turn the servers off, GT7 and GT Sport as we know them are basically gone. People have said to me that hopefully they can learn from GT7 to make Gran Turismo 8 a true return to form, but at this point, how many more opportunities do they need? If they couldn't get it right with 7 when they had everything in their favour, will they ever? I hate to be so pessimistic, but I just can't see it. I don't have that faith anymore. Something has to change drastically for that to be the case, because if we have the same group of people working under the same conditions with the same ideology, why would we expect the results to be different? Unless Polyphony accept GT7 as the embarrassing failure that it is, which despite being one of the most anticipated games of 2022, most people have almost entirely forgotten even exists, then I don't believe Gran Turismo can ever truly be good again. If there's any positive, it's that live service games are dying. This is something which again has started happening during the course of me making these videos and I'm very happy to see. Live services are notorious for stretching out content over a longer period of time to try and keep players invested, and GT7 suffers from a lot of decisions which seem to be based around that. So, maybe things can be better, but that doesn't answer if Polyphony still want to make a proper Gran Turismo game. If, by some miracle, somebody with creative control at Polyphony is watching this video, then this part is directed straight at you. I mean, I know I am just pretending at this point, kind of like how Polyphony pretends GT7 is a proper Gran Turismo game, but it's worth a shot. Ask yourself, what type of racing game do you actually want to make? Because to me, it seems pretty obvious that you don't want to make a game like the older Gran Turismos. And you know, that's fine if that's really true, but just be honest with yourself and your players. So here's the ultimatum. Do you want to try and do those older games justice? Really knuckle down and understand what the whole appeal of them was, and translate that to the current day, with all of the advantages and improvements that come with that? Or do you want to do something else entirely? Whether that be a complete reboot of the series, taking it in a different direction, or, people are going to hate me for saying this, but GT Sport 2. Whatever it is that you actually want to make and have interesting ideas for, and are committed to following through to completion, that is what you need to do. The worst thing you can possibly do is not commit fully to one idea, because then no one will be entirely happy. Even worse is pulling a veil over everything and just pretending that it's something else, and that all is completely fine. And to be clear, none of this is aimed towards the people on the ground floor at Polyphony who don't have any say in the decisions. They're just doing their jobs and doing them very well. It's simply a failure of the management that GT7 can end up as broken and disjointed as it is, despite having a clearly very talented team at their disposal. I think by now I've made my points. Hopefully you can understand why it annoyed me so much how people would act like microtransactions and the economy were the only issues, and if they fixed those then it would all be perfect. Not even close. Like I said before, I personally don't agree that these choices are down to greed, but I understand why people felt that way. Even if after all of this you still think that way, what you have to accept is that beyond that, there are so many other flaws and fundamental problems within GT7 that merely shouting about just one symptom of those problems isn't going to achieve anything. But then again, not a lot will. That has to come internally from polyphony. The case study of GT7 is to me truly unique among video games. Yes, there are plenty of bad and poorly designed games out there, but very often this is due to a few specific reasons. Whether it be a rushed development, lack of budget, no creative direction, or being a soulless cash grab made to capitalise on a current trend, but GT7 doesn't fit any of these archetypes completely. Believe me, I would love more than anything for my series to be made irrelevant by them fixing the problems and restructuring the game. Hopefully not straight away, but over time. But that isn't going to happen. Sure, a few things will change, and as time goes on, this series will become outdated and incorrect in a few places, but the issues are so deep-rooted that it can't simply be fixed just like that. 
Polyphony, you need to look at GT7 with a clear lens. You have a campaign which finishes before it even really starts. A tutorialized snooze fest that gives the illusion of free choice, but actually takes all agency away from the player, more concerned with lecturing than being a fun experience. You trivialize car collecting to the extent where it becomes truly meaningless and unbalanced to the point of insanity. How so many cars have no reason to exist within GT7, but easily could if you just added more events, that we ultimately have to ask if you even remember that you put those cars in the game. Your AI is used so poorly that whether the player is crashing at every other turn or putting in the best laps of their life, the result will almost always be the same. They can barely be considered races. They struggle to navigate sections of track which they had no problem dealing with 20 plus years ago and are so unaware that they can't even begin to comprehend the idea of sportsmanship which you preach to us as players. You've heavily modified some of the most iconic corners from your classic circuits for the sake of a game mode which only a fraction of your players even care about. Your Progression can be broken so easily that I can have millions of credits within minutes of starting the game and can then spend that money to not even have to play the game, skipping most of the races entirely, which is incredible given just how few races you even put into the game in the first place, leaving out so many events which were not only beloved by fans but would give the cars which you so desperately want us to collect actual meaning in the game. You have reward systems which insult your players and actively wastes their time. A completely unbalanced economy which means that grinding the same few races like it's a full-time job is the only way to earn the most expensive cars. Not even mentioning the less important things which you again pretended to put much more effort into than you actually did, or obviously broken features that you've yet to fix since launch. That is just a selection of the things I've covered in this series. How can you look at any of those and feel any sense of pride whatsoever? This is a game which was billed as a true successor to some of the best racing games of all time. This is the story of how an individual considered as the grandfather of an entire subgenre, a true visionary who arguably changed the course of video game history, show that he doesn't get why people loved his games, and honestly makes me question how those games even ended up as good as they did. Despite all of this, I'm still going to keep my eye on Gran Turismo 7, but I don't expect much, and I don't think that anybody else should either. But for now, all I have to say is that yes, Gran Turismo is still my favourite game, but this, to me, is not Gran Turismo, and it never will be.
destined for each other from the start. Your spirit sings, never leaves. A second chance.